I'll try to keep you posted in the next couple of minutes. Great. All right, everyone, welcome to the Open Space Board of Trustees meeting of May 12th, 2021. Um, a special welcome to uh, the public who is joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, as usual, we always start our meetings with a role of the Open Space Board of Trustees members. Um, we'll start with Karen Hallwig. Here. We have Dave Kuntz. Here. Caroline Miller. Present. And Michelle Estrella. Wonderful. I, uh, Hal Holstein, am also present. So we have our quorum and are ready to begin our meeting. Um, our typical first order of business uh, in, is to review the minutes of the prior meeting. Um, in this case, the meeting of Hal? April. Yep. Um, if, if you don't mind, I will, um, it'll take just a second to go through the um, meeting protocol. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Forgive me. No worries. Can folks see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Um, as the chair mentioned, we are so happy to have folks joining us tonight for the um, City of Boulder Open Space Board of Trustees meeting. Um, and uh, with our virtual meetings, we have a few items of protocol that we'll just like to go, go over. Um, any activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere the meeting uh, with the meeting are prohibited. Our time for speaking and asking questions is limited to the open comment and to the public hearing. Um, either the chair or I will recognize folks um, uh, when those times are, um, when those public hearings are open and we'll call on folks. And we're gonna ask folks to um, keep their comments to two minutes tonight. We'll ask folks, we ask folks to please use a full name. You can um, change your, your, the way that your name displays uh, using the three, if you hover over um, your image or your, your part of the um, screen where your name is, you should be able to see a couple of dots and then you can change, change your name to a full name, please. Um, let's see, let's go to the next one. And um, so our public testimony will be by voice only and not by video. Um, the chair and I will enforce these rules. Our chat function should be used only for te technical issues and it's set to just communicate with me, the host. It's super hard if we have um, comments uh, that people are seeing and it's sort of like outside conversation. So that's really hard for staff and the board and that's why we have it set to host only. If there's an issue um, that needs to be raised, you can send it to me, the host, and I'll raise it um, with the chair or with staff. Um, and then also only um, our staff or applicants, I guess it's not applicants, I'm used to planning board, will be able to share screen. Okay, so when we get to the open comment, um, we'll use the raise hand function for anyone who hasn't signed up prior. And so if you hover at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to get to this participants area, which you see there. And then um, there are three dots and you, there's a raise hand function. Um, that's with most um, versions of Zoom. I think some actually see a little raise hand function and otherwise um, you can also use Alt Y for a PC, Option Y for a Mac, or star nine if you're on the phone. Okay, and I think with that, I am finished with protocol and back to you. Thank you, Jean. Um, yes, before we uh, look forward into new business, we always return to the minutes of our prior meeting, in this case, April 14th, um, to approve the minutes. Um, as is our usual custom, I'll start on page one. How does the board feel about the first page? Any changes, Michelle? I see you and you're on mute, yep. I'm trying to find my mute, unmute button, sorry. Um, I got my screens all mixed up. Yeah, the first page of the minutes, and I've already talked to Leah about this, is that it has um, Kurt Brown as attending and me is um, MIA, but I was actually there. Great point. Can, uh, can we, uh, we'll, we'll get an adjustment on that, please. Um, and and uh, certainly any template going forward. Karen? On the very last line on the first page, um, 
It says, she said parks and recreation and OSMP should be separate within, and for clarity, I think it should say the regulations I, yep, I, I think that would clarify. Thank you, Karen. That's how I recall that as well. Are you locating that down there at the bottom for Lisa Spaulding's comment? Yes. Okay, great. Anything else on page one? Okay, how about page two? Karen? Um, in the third paragraph under agenda item five, there's a phrase that's duplicated. So at the end of the fourth line, uh, I would suggest deleting the words communicated back to the full so that it reads as well as asked that this be communicated back to the full community. Great. Anything additional on page two? There, there's one ad additional place. Um, and I don't know exactly, Dan, what the, the lingo is when you close an easement. But in the last sentence, right above agenda item six, I think it should say he added that the Longs Garden easement has officially closed. How do you ref refer, to refer to what happens with easements, Dan? Um, well, I mean, it is a real estate transaction that was complete. Completed would be another word um, or has been executed. But it, but it wasn't Long's Garden that was executed. It's the easement for Long's Garden. Oh, the, right? oh, the Long's Garden, the conservation easement over the Long's Garden property has been executed. Thank you. Is that, are, are we clear there? Everybody happy? Okay. And that um, concludes the minutes, I believe. Anything else on that page um, before I seek a motion to approve the minutes? I so move, Hal. Thank you, Dave. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Michelle. So we'll call the roll, starting with uh, Karen Hallwig. Yes. Approve the minutes, great. Dave Kuntz. Yes. Caroline Miller. Yes. And Michelle Australia. Yes. And I also approve and that's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Um, Dan, do we have Burton on the line yet? Um, we do not, but we have Mark Davison, who would be obviously the uh, service area manager over the Rangers would be here to do this. And then we plan on uh, noting this recording and providing that to that the, to the full Ranger group tomorrow through an email link. So um, they will be able to refer back to this time and and be able to reflect on whatever is presented here right now. Tremendous. Well, Mark, yeah, we we we'd invite you to tell us about uh, the remarkable service that your department provided during the recent tragedy. Thank you, Hal. Um, it is it's it's hard really to express some of the gratitude we've got for both PD, the Rangers, and all the first responders on that day. Uh, we know the police officers obviously deserve the attention they got and the praise for their work in responding to the tragedy. I would say, um, along with the PD and all the other first responders, the Rangers were among the first to respond. Uh, they worked off the dispatch channels, and the shooting was unfolding, and working with police, the sort of the way the team came together to deal with this, frankly, tragedy was that they all worked as a team. And there's a reason why there's been a long partnership with the Boulder PD department and the training that's gone into that led to the ability to respond in a way that made us proud and frankly, 
view the Rangers in many respects as heroes that day. I think a couple of points to really point out is um, most people aren't really kind of typically aware that of this type of uh, expertise the Rangers have in the sense that it's not a typical day-to-day -day thing, obviously, that people would think about in regards to Rangers. But they are trained and prepared to assist during emergency and significant events for the safety of the public. And when they responded on that Monday, it was with courage and willingness to put into practice all the training and learned skills. And it's in a, obviously a situation we hope never will happen, but their response, and frankly, at the time, the city manager acknowledged the fact that we were able to support and uh, perhaps in a way avert some of the tragedy that occurred. But we still want to recognize that a fellow officer went down and our hearts go out to him and the family. And finally, I'd just like to say that uh, is something we should never forget the fact that the rangers and others frankly in public safety working for the city take on serious risks and every time they put their uniform on they're putting themselves in harm's way to protect all of us and that's just what i'd like to acknowledge today thank you hal for that opportunity well thank you mark um certainly uh it's it's wonderful to hear about that cooperation and i'll also add um the department's uh, attendance at the city vigil and the attendance of ragers themselves at that event was also quite meaningful and deeply appreciated. Does any other trustees have comments they'd like to make on that? Dave? Yeah, I'd just like to extend um, our gratitude toward the uh, rangers uh, for the service and uh, actions that they not only took on that day, but as Mark as you mentioned, uh, they, they take every day actually. And um, sometimes we, we don't really acknowledge that or, or you know, for, forget to do that, but uh, we are very appreciative of all the work that they do out uh, on the ground and in protection of the open space and mountain park system, as well as uh, the people in the community. So be sure and thank them for, for us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Wonderful. Well, certainly um, all members of the staff of the Open Space Department uh, through all of uh, COVID-19, the recent events, this tragedy, um, we continue to be impressed by everyone's willingness to really go above and beyond for the community. So thank you so much for that commitment. And, and thank you, thank you, Helen, the board. It, the acknowledgement means a lot to the Rangers and like Dan said, we'll definitely share this back with the team. We appreciate it. Certainly. Thank you. Well, um, I guess uh, with that, and, and perhaps the public may be interested in offering their thanks as well, let's move ourselves towards the public uh, comment period for items not identified for public hearing. Um, I'd just like to clarify, we will be holding public hearings this evening on two points of main business, which include uh, the acquisition of uh, potential lands at Sombrero Marsh and a, a motion recommending approval of open space other lands in the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. So if you have comments on those two particular topics, we're gonna create a special opportunity for that subject matter. Um, the current public comment that we're gonna open is on any and all matters other than those two. And I'll turn it over to Jean to orchestrate that for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, we had one, uh, one community member sign up in, for open comment ahead. Um, Mar Marcus Poppets is here and I'll unmute you in just a moment. If there are others who would like to speak during the general open comment, the, please raise your hand now. And let's see, Marcus, you can go ahead and unmute. Okay, are you able to hear me? We are. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so my name is Marcus Popetz. I'm here representing Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance. Um, I also live in the city at 2197 Jordan Place. Uh, I'm here to comment on the draft letter to the visitor use master plan for the Eldo to Walker Trail and State Park, and more specifically on the public process. Um, so that public process started out as a gold standard for those that were involved in it, um, collaborating all the agencies together, the type of thing we need here in the front range. Um, and as you as OSBT, you recognize the importance of that. Uh, but then CPW unilaterally pulled out of that process and then using Boulders County's words from their website, CPW announced their intent to take that into their own visitor use master planning process. Um, and 
to further quote, you know, after that process finished, um, it wasn't a collaboration with the land managements. Once again, it was a, a decision where Boulder County staff, quote unquote, received the draft plan at the same time it was released to the public and CPW informed Boulder County that they will no longer consider the potential for the El Dorado, El Dorado Trail. Um, these words announced, informed or not collaboration and um, whether you believe in the trail or whether it should have gone forward, we are extremely concerned about public process, um, not being open to the citizens of Boulder City and Boulder County. Um, you know, the excluding of the staff and their input in that decision is something that I think should concern us all, regardless of our opinion on the trail. So um, our organization has no power to encourage CPW or force CPW to collaborate with OSMP in Boulder County. Um, so we're here to encourage you. I saw your letter asking them to include you uh, in trail decisions, but I would love you to make it even more strong um, because you're the only ones that can actually help us in future uh, recreation decisions to be able to make sure that our public voice is heard. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up and I thank you for your service. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. If anyone else would like to speak in the, during open comment, please raise hand now. I am seeing none. Okay. Um, with that, Dan, I believe um, the order of operations for each of the next two items, we start with a staff presentation. We then move to a public comment period. Uh, is, is that the correct order? Uh, just uh, uh, typically we'll have clarifying questions before the public hearing. So presentation, clarifying questions, public hearing, and then a broader discussion and consideration period as by the board. Dave, I see you over there, Dave. Uh, Hal, before we commence, um, can we do a quick agenda check uh, before we start? Yes. Um, um, are there particular items you'd like to raise? Yeah, I'd like to uh, put on under matters from the board. Uh, we have to, the board has to appoint a representative to the Greenways Advisory Committee. And so I'd like to make sure that uh, we do that this evening. Great. Um, I recommend we'll, we'll insert that as item C, the third in the list. Great. Thanks. Excellent. Michelle? Oh, I was wondering if we could make that, um, to bump that up. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, we, we can bump that up. Why don't we... Um, why don't we address that immediately in matters from the board? Why don't we do that as our first thing? We'll replace item A. Sorry, sorry for that, Michelle. I should have remembered better. And we will address that straight away. Does that work for any, everybody? Any other issues or concerns? Great, I guess with that, Dan, we'll turn it over to you um, to discuss Sombrero Marsh. Yes, this is a continuation of our discussion from last month, but this month we're moving more into the uh, recommendation phase. Uh, so tonight from Open Space staff, we have Bethany Collins and Don D'Amico who will be providing information. And I'm sure Bethany will maybe introduce other folks that might be here uh, depending on the question. So with that, I will turn things over to our real estate services supervisor, Bethany Collins. Thanks, Dan. Um, good evening, trustees. Uh, let me get my screen sharing going. Your background, Bethany, is more familiar than Leah's. Oh, really? <laughs> Funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where is Leah's? <laughs> Where are you, Leah? She's in Nepal. <laughs> nice. Good vacation destination. <laughs> um, all right, can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. Um, all right, with this agenda item tonight, uh, staff is seeking a recommendation to council for approval of proposed phased land acquisition between the city's Open Space and Mountain Parks Department and Boulder County Parks and Open Space Department involving several small parcels of land uh, totaling approximately nine and a half acres adjacent to the city's Sombrero Marsh open space property. Um, Don D'Amico and I will provide this brief presentation uh, to supplement the information provided in your memo in the packet. And Tina Burghart, uh, land officer and Bevan Carruthers, resource protection supervisor with Boulder County Parks and Open Space 
are also available uh, with us tonight in case there are questions of the county. Hang on, let me get this working. Okay, as detailed last month, uh, the Greater Sombrero Marsh Complex has a very complicated ownership structure. The city owns approximately 54 acres in the Sombrero Marsh, in Sombrero Marsh, acquired via multiple uh, transactions from 1995 to 2014 for open space purposes and managed by OSMP, as well as about 8.7 acres where EcoCycle is located. OSMP's management goals here include restoring and sustaining the ecological health of the marsh and using the educationally rich outdoor setting for teaching about wetland ecology, environmental restoration, and land stewardship. Boulder County owns approximately nine and a half acres acquired in 1975 as outlots from the Sombrero, marsh, or Sombrero Ranch subdivision, which includes some shoreline of the marsh and uplands and neighborhood uh, trail access from Swallow Lane. These are the parcels that are subject of this subject <laughs> the subject of this proposed transaction. Additionally, the Sombrero Ranch HOA owns a couple of outlots overlaying the East Boulder and Enterprise Ditch corridors. OSMP staff has recently been contacted by the HOA about acquisition of these parcels and is evaluating them for city ownership as well. Boulder Valley School District owns several parcels surrounding the Marsh Complex, including the site of their administrative uh, uh, headquarters and the Sombrero Marsh Education, Environmental Education Center, operated by Thorn Nature Experience. Sombrero Marsh is also surrounded by additional residential and more urban development and transportation and utility infrastructure, including ownership and management by private parties, Boulder Jewish Commons, and ditch companies. And Don will take over and talk a little bit about the ecological resources. Thanks, Bethany. And um, thank you, trustees. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of um, the uh, ecological background and management issues of the marsh. Um, to start out with, the multiple ownership of land at Sombrero um, tends to complicate its management and can impact its ecological functioning. Um, as detailed in the attachment to your memo, uh, Sombrero is an inland salt marsh, which has a rare wetland type in the Boulder Valley. The marsh contains soils, hydrology, and vegetation that combine to create important habitat for shorebirds, as well as uh, waterfowl, um, a variety of mammal species, amphibians, and a uh, very diverse invertebrate community. Open space staff and partners have put significant time and money into the restoration and management of city property at Sombrero. But over the years, we found that management and stewardship um, of the marsh and the surrounding uplands is complicated under the multi-agency ownership. So as you know, currently Boulder County and the city of Boulder, uh, Boulder own, and they manage their own respective parcels at Sombrero according to their uh, own individual land use policy, regulations, resource management practices. And sometimes those things are not necessarily aligned. So um, this can lead to ineffective management, um, confusion for the public, and can be detrimental to the overall eco ecological health of the marsh. Some samples of uh, examples of those things include um, mosquito management, which is one of the most important management issues at Sombrero Marsh from an ecological perspective. Uh, can you? Thank you. Um, so, mosquito management mosquito management has been conducted under under the city's mosquito management program since two thousand two, and the city's program emphasizes an ecosystem approach to mosquito management and seeks to limit the use of pesticides throughout the city. That program was updated in 2000 and approved by council in 2019 um, to take an even more, uh, more of an ecosystem approach. And um, we have approved, we have only approved uh, BTI, which is a naturally occurring larvicide that targets mosquito larva for mosquito management at Sombrero due to uh, the environmental impacts of other products. 
Um, BTI is the only product that's ever been applied to city-owned portions of Sabrera Marsh since its acquisition by the city. Uh, Boulder County uses a wide range of pesticides to control mosquitoes in the county, including uh, broad spectrum insecticides uh, for adult mosquito control. They also use larvicides like we do BTI and also some other um, growth inhibitors and also uh, pupicides such as surface uh, surficants or surface oils that are applied to the surface water and um, basically prevent larval insects from um, uh, um, becoming pupa and, and emerging from the water surface. Um, the city doesn't really have any information on which products are applied to the county owned portions of the marsh. Um, but if land is transferred, if this approval is transferred, uh, or the transfer is approved, mosquito management would come under the city's mosquito management program for the entire marsh. Another issue is weed management. Um, some of the same issues apply here as with mosquito management. The city and county have different approaches to weed management. And when, just in general, when adjacent landowners manage vegetation, on their respective lands different, uh, differently, it makes it really difficult to um, uh, control the spread of weeds from one property to the other and really um, get a handle on just the, the overall weed situation on either property. The county also allows access over their outlot as does the city, which has contributed to the creation of an unplanned network of undesignated trails throughout the properties. Um, consolidated ownership would allow for more thoughtful and comprehensive planning for future access, as well as consistent fencing and, uh, and a, a consistent approach towards signage. Uh, dogs are not permitted on city open space land around Sombrero Marsh, uh, whereas they are allowed on county land. And these things can just be confusing for the public and um, you know, the enforcement issues are difficult for rangers to, to force and to educate the public about what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So just in general, um, you know, coordinating management between the two open space programs that currently own land at Sombrero Marsh have, um, and, and that sometimes have competing interests um, can be inefficient, it can be time consuming for staff. Um, it can take away from staff's ability to really effective, effectively manage the marsh as well as um, manage other priorities in our annual work plans. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Bethany. Thanks, Don. Okay, so recently OSMP reached out to Boulder County Parks and Open Space to suggest consolidating ownership under one entity and the agencies have discussed the proposed transaction. As partners, the city and county are proposing to carry out this phase land tra transaction where phase one would be the acquisition by the city of the 4.25 acre Western parcel for $34,000 or $8,000 an acre, which includes a portion of the marsh and shoreline and would allow near-term consolidated management of the most significant ecological resources, mosquito control and proposed boundary fencing projects in the area. And this is uh, somewhat of a view of the, the there's no fencing or, or boundary lines uh, to term, I mean, uh, identified, but this is a generally a, a picture of the area of phase one. As in phase two, the city will then have, as phase two, the city will then have five years to either acquire the remaining parcels for $42,000 or work with the county to identify a mutually beneficial exchange of land of equivalent value. The land exchange would be contingent upon additional OSBT and city council approval. If the purchase or exchange does not happen within five years, the agreement will include a 2% annual escalation. Again, photos of those phase two parcels. This proposed transaction will fulfill at least two master plan strategies, as well as several charter purposes by having ownership and management control over the entire marsh wetland complex and ecosystem health and partner, uh, excuse me, <laughs> as well, over the entire marsh wetland complex and ecosystem health and partnering for a land acquisition that preserves water resources and fragile ecosystems. The master plan also emphasizes that expansion of habitat blocks is a critical component of OSMP's approach to preservation and important to ecological health and resilience. 
If the phased acquisition is approved as the parcels are as the parcels are acquired, they will remain closed consistent with Section 886 of the Boulder Revised Code for up to five years to allow for resource assessment and development of management recommendation. During this time, the properties will be managed consistent with adjacent OSMP lands and charter purposes, and OSMP staff will evaluate the resource management and restoration needs, as well as access and environmental education opportunities for the properties. With the phased approach, the 886 closure may be unnecessary or shorter for the phase two parcels, since some of the evaluation will be accomplished in advance of the city's acquisition. Staff will also seek an amendment to the city manager 833 rule, which prohibits dogs west of the East Boulder ditch to include the Western parcel. An assessment of these parcels will also include an evaluation against the criteria set forth in the OSMP visitor master plan to determine the suitability for inclusion in the Sombrero Marsh Habitat Conservation Area, which was established in 2006 via Ordinance, 7, Ordinance 7459. And with that, I'll go to the board for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Bethany and Don, for the wonderful presentation and also the uh, updates to the memo from the prior session you led us on in this. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, and so, yes, just as a reminder, we are going to have clarifying questions, then we will do public hearing on this topic, and then we will return for uh, deliberations. Are there any clarifying questions on some Borough Marsh? Um, yeah, I guess, I, I, I don't know if this is a clarifying question or a deliberation, but um, I just was curious why, why the city and county had different dog approaches, dog rule approaches, and, and do you know why? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about all those emails we got about Sanitas and um, sort of the potential backlash to people not knowing or realizing that we're going to um, change the rules of dogs in that entire area? Um, I don't I don't necessarily have a, a, a good answer for that. I'm not sure if if uh, John Potter can can jump on um, or if Dan does other than we're we're different agencies with different regulatory uh, framework um, for our, our properties and and um, uh, don't I, I that, yeah, go ahead. I, I think that's right and and uh, Steve Arnstead. Uh, who just informed me about five minutes ago that he's having an internet issue. So I'm not sure, sure if he, if he's on, but uh, uh, Michelle, yeah, every, uh, all of our area plans, our TSAs or our site specific plans, uh, we will, uh, 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 the rules, uh, allowance, not allowance, on leash, voice and sight, uh, all those particulars are always addressed um, within our our planning processes, and of, and of course, uh, uh, Boulder County does not have a voice and sight program, so that automatically makes us very distinct. But yeah, it's it's um, all these things regarding dogs is determined through a pretty robust public process with board input, uh, ultimately council uh, consideration, and a lot of public engagement, and that's how we arrive at very specific uh, nuances in regards to. Uh, 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 dog management. So I don't know, Steve, if you have anything to add to that. But. And the only thing I'd add, and hopefully you can hear me well enough, is the just the history of our program kind of lent itself that um, really that when we started having public open lands, there weren't even leash requirements within the city. So the evolution of our system actually grew up with a lot of initial opportunities for dogs to be under in essence voice and sight control. And so our systems kind of matured with that and that's allowed kind of the maturing of that program somewhat different from a lot of other peer land management agencies. And it's also kind of evolved to have the, the level of support for those off leash opportunities that are made th available through kind of a very um, specific, you know, a, a program with the voice and sight tag program. Yeah. And I don't know if John wants to add any specifics to the Sombrero Marsh area. Um, and I don't know if you want to elaborate on this particular area. Maybe just um, to, to elaborate a little bit on, on a point Bethany made that on one side of the East Boulder ditch, we have dogs allowed. And on the other side of the East Boulder ditch, 
they're not allowed uh, where the marsh is because we wanted to have greater protection in that area, which is the environmental protection zone for Sombrero Marsh. So even the city has two different approaches to dogs on this particular property. The county, I believe, has just a leash restriction on all of its lands for, um, for, for dogs. They have a separate approach. That's just, as Dan was saying, how it developed over time with that system. We're not proposing, John, to change uh, on if we acquire the county properties, uh, we're not proposing to change the dog rules on those properties, are we? No, uh, and that's what, well, so well, what mm -hmm. you mentioned, and um, step in, Bethany, if, I'm, if I get it wrong, but the, the area, what we're proposing is that the areas to the south and east of the ditch would be managed the way our lands currently are managed south and east of the right. ditch. Right. And everything to the west of the ditch that is acquired from the county would be managed as a, as a no dog area. Correct. You got it right. Good. Thanks. Does, does that make sense, Dave? Did I? Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is for the portion of the county property. Well, actually, I'm probably thinking of the second acquisition where the oh, yeah. social trails are and, and stuff like that. Um, that portion, we're still going to keep the dogs on leash requirement south or east of the East Boulder Ditch. Right. But that that second acquisition would also have a piece on the other side of the ditch that would right. be no dogs. And then the reason for no dogs actually is because of the habitat conservation area designation of Correct. that property that you know surrounds the marsh. Correct. Um, I can jump in for a second, Dave. Actually, the entire uh, the the entire ownership, um, except for what we acquired in 2014, is designated as a HTA at at Sombrero. So there is portion east of the ditch um, that is designated as a HCA. So the 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 dog regulations as they're applied out there currently aren't necessarily consistent because there hasn't been uh, the, the, the trail, the on or off trail designation doesn't exist east of the ditch right now. And so um, once the once the HCA is activated, the, the trail uh, planning for the area is done, any, you know, off trail or any dog regulations would uh, consistent with the HA, uh, HCA would be updated at that time. Yeah. Great, thanks. Is that helpful? Okay. <laughs> Great. Any any more clarification needed on that? I'm sure we'll return to it in the later portion of the meeting. Uh, Caroline, I see you. I just wanted to understand. Um, right now, we're doing clarifying questions, but at what point are there, there are other questions for Sombrero? I just want to make sure my questions are in the right spot. Oh, well, we're 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 just sort of clarifying our understanding now. Then we're going to take comments from the public, and then we'll return to deliberate, there can certainly be some more questions asked then, but if, if you just uh, need clarification on anything, now's a great time. Okay, I think mine are better suited for the, the second portion then. Thank you. Karen? Um, on page 19 in our packet, there's a section on restoration and site management. And I just wanna um, clarify by asking the question, which of those things listed in the restoration and site management section at the bottom of page 19, bottom half of page 19, have already been completed and which ones are still ongoing? Don, can you jump in on that or John? So maybe while Don's uh, looking for that, Karen, is that, are you talking about that bulleted list that starts with planting of native wetland plants? Yes, and also the list above that, which includes uh, uh, moving fill material, digging several small depressions. Oh, okay. Yeah, Don, can you, can you address that? I'm scrolling down there right now. <laughs> is, is there anyone who could provide a PDF page for uh, for others in the public too? 23. 
Thank you. So going through that bulleted list of five items, um, number one, the planting of native wetland plants has been completed um, several times. Actually, we've supplemented planting when we've um, when we uh, found it necessary because the previous planting wasn't um, successful. We continue to, to control invasive and noxious weeds. That's like on all of our proper properties, it's an ongoing um, uh, project. Uh, planting of native upland grasses, shrubs, and flowering plants. Um, that goes along with uh, the first bullet and has been done uh, multiple times. Enhancement of wildlife habitat quality. Um, we have planted some native shrubs um, and we've improved water quality um, over the years, not with any, any direct, um, I guess, water quality enhancements, but we've managed the hydrology of the marsh so that whereas when we first acquired it, we had quite a number of uh, incidents where there was um, off-gassing of hydrogen and sulfide gas, which um, isn't necessarily a, health, a public health issue, except when it's at really high concentrations. But it was uh, basically a nuisance for the community, especially the mobile home park on the uh, north side of Sombrero Marsh. So we've managed um, the hydrology such that we, we reduced the number of, of um, uh, over nutrient over nutrification events over the years and um, we have monitored um, the restoration projects and those activities and kind of done adaptive management over the years um, that happened probably within the first five or six years of formally within the first five or six years of the um, original restoration that was done in 2001 but as we make kind of tweaks or make um, management adjustments to the property, we, you know, we, we obviously monitor the results of those adjustments um, for, you know, years afterwards. And, and I would just add or point out, Karen, that that, of course, was all activity that we did to restore the other the parcels that we already own on the, the ones that we're talking about tonight it's really only uh, control of invasive noxious weeds that would be one of these activities that we would be looking at uh, immediately to, to implement. Okay, and the uh, four lines above the bulleted list, the digging small depressions to form deeper open wa water areas, has that been completed or yet to be done? That was done as part of the uh, the first major restoration work in 2001. Okay, and then uh, below the bulleted list, um, it indicates that uh, volunteers and BVSD students have been significantly involved in restoration. Is that still ongoing or is that completed? That's, that's ongoing. Um, when we do, um, for instance, non-native tree removal or planting out there. Um, within our volunteer services group, we try to get volunteer groups out there to help us do that. Kind of um, it helps us to get the job done when we only have a three or four person crew to have 20 people join us for a, a day of planting or a day of um, weed management is really helpful. So that's really an ongoing effort. Great, thank you very much. Caroline. Thank you. Um, so it says uh, in our packet that the property will be temporarily closed as it typically is after acquisitions. Um, does that mean the entirety of the property or does that actually mean the, the parcel? Yeah, so uh, any uh, under 886, any newly acquired property uh, is closed by city manager rule for a uh, 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 identified period of time to allow for resource assessment for planning and to determine, you know, how, how to best manage it and open it for to the public. 
Um, so that's any new parcel. So it would be just as we acquire the, the smaller county parcels. Um, there is, uh, again, because of the HCA designation out of out there, um, there is a, a, a possibility or, or a likelihood that once uh, additional planning is done that the HCA will also have some obviously no off trail access, um, you know, once once those those trails are identified and, and established. Does that okay. help? <laughs> I'm just asking specifically, um, you know, because the property is used by the Thorne Institute and, and they do things in the summer. So um, it it will be closed this summer or just the parcel? Parcel. Just the parcel. So the count, the county parcel, that western parcel that's phase one um, would be closed. It is not um, utilized. It's not, it, you know, it shouldn't be very accessible. It's actually part of the marsh. So it wouldn't be uh, uh, part of what Thorn uh, uses under their, their management plan and partnership agreement with, with us. So yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Great. Does anyone else have any clarifying questions? Seeing none, I think we are ready to move to the period of uh, public comment and public hearing on this topic. So I'll turn it back over to Jean. Thank you. Um, it, if folks would like to speak during this time, um, if you would please use the raise hand function to let us know that you'd like to do that. I am not seeing any currently. While we're waiting, um, I will mention that I saw a very interesting email uh, on this topic um, from a woman named Suzanne Webel, who was discussing the history of this property and its use uh, for equestrian usage in the long distant past. And um, as a student of history in this system, I just thought it was unique um, and worthy of mention. It's unfortunate uh, she cannot join us to describe that experience today um, because she has the lived experience on that property. Um, but it did fascinate me that at one point there was uh, significant equestrian activity there. Do we see any other hands? I see no other hands. Okay, I guess uh, with that, we open and close uh, the public hearing on the topic of Sombrero Marsh and we move back into deliberations from the board. So I guess, why don't I uh, start the discussion simply by framing um, where, you know, the business at hand is a recommendation uh, by the Open Space Board of Trustees requested by staff for acquisition in phased approach of 9.5 acres with a primary goal to defragment the ownership parcels in the Sombrero Marsh area. So um, what, what uh, if anything, do folks want to discuss about that request? Caroline? Yeah, um, I spoke with um, neighbors surrounding the marsh and um, historically there are pictures as well. Um, there are times that it is dry, there, there is no marsh. Um, it just wasn't mentioned at all in the packet that that there will be no water there at times. So I was wondering if anyone could just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, we, the, the city does not own storage rights to place water directly in Sombrero Marsh. We have water rights in the East Boulder ditch that we use to irrigate land to the east of the marsh, basically between the marsh and the East Boulder ditch. And um, depending on how much water we apply, some of that water ends up as tailwater and actually goes into the marsh. Um, but legally we can't, we can't put water directly into the marsh. And just the hydrologic cycle of wetlands like that it's, it's really important that there be hydrologic variability um, and it, it, it helps with nutrient cycling, it helps with um, vegetation management, it uh, affects, can affect uh, macroinvertebrate habitat and aquatic um, plant growth. And so we found that 
um, you know, these natural hydrologic cycles of wetting and drying. There might be periods um, just like, you know, drought periods where the marsh might be completely dry for a couple years. And that, that picture I showed of just the white, um, the white soil in the basin, that's, that was actually a year that the marsh dried out and it, it was dry for about two or three years, as I recall. And um, that was actually salt, it wasn't snow. It looks like, looks like snow, but um, so that allows for, um, again, vegetation to either expand and grow down into the basin or when water is high, typically because it's so salty, that places enough stress on the emergent plants like bulrushes and cattails to kind of um, uh, basically uh, stress them out enough to where they, they kind of um, retreat to the margins of the marsh. So you've got varying years when there's, um, you know, open water like you see now and other times um, when the water, when there isn't as much water, when you, where you see the, the um, uh, invasion of, if you will, or the colonization of the basin of the marsh with bulrushes and cattails and taller emergent wetland species like that. So um, again, we, we like the fact that there is that hydrologic variability because it really helps with the ecological health and the habitat values of, of the marsh. I know the public doesn't necessarily like it because um, you know when it's dry, there aren't as many, um, certainly, certainly waterfowl and shorebirds um, don't like it when it's really dry. Um, one of the things that creates the great shorebird habitat out there is as the water recedes, it creates mudflats, much like, much like tidal mudflats that species like phalaropes and avocets and other wading shorebirds really, really like. And that's a, that's a really a rare commodity in the Boulder Valley anymore. Okay, thank you. And then um, when I looked at the OSMP property map, I just want to clarify on the east side, it seems like when you look at the property map that we would not own the entirety of the water. Is that accurate or is the OS, am I just looking at the OSMP property map incorrectly? Um, we would own the entirety of what is considered the marsh itself, the, the marsh acreage, so. Um, okay, like when you pull up the property map for the um, mm -hmm. first parcel that we're talking about. Right. There's kind of a very small break between that and the green that shows OSMP and as well as on like the direct, that, cause that's a little bit under and then the same thing on the direct east side. And it could just be, you know, like a mapping. It but, might be a difference between the parcel layers. Yeah, and the, the OSMP mapping. Yeah. I think I think what that might be, there's a there's a layer on that map, the, um, the blue layer. It's, it's kind of a light blue that shows, it's an open water GIS layer and that um, that might look like it doesn't include other other parts of the marsh. It, it looks a little weird. I I agree, Caroline. It looks it looks kind of funny down there, but it's only because of that blue open water quote, quote open water GIS layer that we have on the map. Okay, thank you, Dave. Yeah, I, I have a question uh, that I think John or maybe Mark can uh, address. As far as the educational programming uh, that Thorne is conducting out there, uh, how do we anticipate the, their use of uh, the parcels that we're considering tonight? I think that's a good question, Dave. I think that's um, typically under the MOU we've got with Thorne, we have an annual work planning meeting and that uh, we'll normally do two of those. One will be like early in the year, one late in the year. So I think for us, that would be where we have that discussion. I think it's like to be determined how we get agreements on that. So has Thorne uh, traditionally used uh, those properties? You know? uh, my understanding is that they have an agreement currently with the county for uh, educational purposes for use of those areas, similar to the way they have an agreement with us, but I don't know the exact details of that. 
Dave, I, I can jump in for a minute. They do have, um, and Mark, uh, they do have a, a permit on um, those two Eastern parcels currently with the county, which is another reason, you know, we're doing a, a phase two is to determine what their use is, how that might um, come under the fold of, of the city and not to acquire it with a permit in place or things that we can have those planning discussions. So, so the permit uh, that the county has issued, are, are we uh, anticipating extending that during the time or, or what is our uh, objective there? Again, we, uh, that, that's part of the, the planning meeting that, that Mark has, has detailed. A lot depends on their year-to-year -year, um, year -year, uh, uh, programming plans and, and um, how they use both open space, parks and open space, their Lafayette um, you know, uh, uh, properties, things like that, uh, kind of their, their system-wide planning, so to speak, as well. Um, so that would certainly be uh, something that is part of our, our upcoming planning discussion with them, yeah. In, in the HCA designation, when it becomes official, right. then that will uh, certainly be uh, integrated into the permitting process for Thorn, I assume, right? Correct. Those are all the, the, the considerations that, that and, and again, why we want to take this phased approach so that we do, we do have time to consider those multiple levels of use and, and restriction, frankly. Great. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Do um, HCAs prohibit the use of the, um, do the HCA rules prohibit the use of the lands for educational purposes? Uh, they prohibit off trail use. So you would have to get off trail permitting to, to allow any kind of, any kind of, you know, use outside of the, the designated trail corridors. And Daphne, I would just add in the sort of 20 right. <laughs> with yeah. fawn with like, they'll sometimes like one of the goals might be to help with restoration. It might be environmental education, the work with our education staff. So I'd say that that's what Bethany's pointing out is well, we'll hopefully continue that relation and figure out how it all sort of integrates. Uh, yep. as, not just at Sombrero, but like Bethany said, across the system. I know OSMP values um, environmental education, and I know that's you know one of our charter purposes, so I'm not worried about that at all, but I just want to make sure that that is something that we, we continue to value as we look at this second phase. Um, but I, otherwise, I think that this acquisition makes all the sense in the world, and uh, and I'm supportive of it. Thanks, Michelle. I'll step I'll step in there um, and riff on that. I agree with you, Michelle. I um, find myself convinced that uh, the ecosystem lens has been applied very nicely here. I believe there is synergy uh, where we reduce administrative cost in liaising with the county. Um, and we refocus those efforts on actual ecosystem building, particularly in phase one. Um, I think there'll be ample opportunity within the planning phases for integration to address the right balance of uses in this. Um, but as the fundamental question of does defragmenting this and taking it into our, our system as opposed to the county, I'm, I'm a clear supporter of, of that myself. Uh, yeah, one thing I would add as well is that uh, similar to Wonderland Lake, to which we had the you know a, a very uh, good and long conversation about uh, a few months ago, you know these undeveloped natural lands in urban contexts are extremely important, and it uh, the management uh, challenges associated with them are are also different and and can be high, but their importance in kind of the urban landscape is, is extremely uh, high. And so I do think that uh, a place like Sombrero Marsh warrants a very careful uh, management attention and, um, and provides those educational opportunities that I think are extremely important for the community as well. Thanks, Dave. Caroline or Karen, do you, yep, Caroline? Um just so the public knows or the people that are surrounding the area, when we talk about um, fencing issues um, with Sombrero Marsh, um, does, does that mean like in regards to the ecological um, perspective that we think 
fencing in the marsh is something that is being considered or is that not what we're talking about? I'm asking one because of um, the cost of doing that and then just so the public that lives around there has an idea of that. It would be looked at, um, uh, and again, it's it's part of the assessment is looked at as a management tool, both to establish the boundary, um, fence in the marsh, prevent encroachments, which are uh, historically an issue um, in uh, you know when when you're surrounded by by residential or or private properties, um, to look at those management issues, and um, you know we don't the 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 either or is to to look at. Um, fencing as a management tool or to, you know, have to um, look at potential encroachment and licensing things for, you know, as a, as, as we go, go forward with stewardship of the marsh. Um, so that's, that's always a management consideration every time we acquire a property. And so that would be part of the, the resource management assessment. Karen, any final thoughts from you? It, it seems we're getting close to some consensus here. Um, I just want to mention um, the value of this property. Uh, I agree with everything that, that my colleagues have said, but its value in terms of providing a learning laboratory for uh, volunteers as well as students, and especially in this case, Boulder Valley, school district students to um, connect to the outdoors and do some service learning kinds of opportunities in helping to manage the ecosystem out there, um, especially with respect to native species, to non-native species, invasive species, um, and would refer to the, the master plans um, CCEI three and six and seven items, which involve things like Michelle and Hal have referred to in terms of, of engaging um, youth as well as other visitors to inspire stewardship and uh, expanded understanding of the ecosystem out there. And I think this site provides a wonderful opportunity for doing that. And if we, if we have all the parcels under OSMP control, then those kinds of activities can be carried out in a more integrated way. I agree wholeheartedly, Karen. With those comments, I think we might be ready to lift a motion for recommendation that the Boulder City Council approve the FAVES acquisition of 9.5 acres of land from Boulder County adjacent to some borough marsh open space for open space purposes. Unless anyone else would like to move that, I'm willing to move it myself. I'll second. We have Dave on a second. With that, we can call the roll. We start with uh, Karen. Yes. Dave, you clearly vote for. <laughs> yes. Uh, Caroline. Yes. Michelle. Yes. And I also affirm. So um, thank you so much, uh, Bethany and Don, um, for guiding us through this. We see big opportunities ahead, and uh, your hard work uh, is greatly appreciated on all the details here. Yeah, and if I could just take a second to thank our partners and our colleagues over at Boulder County. I know Bevan and Tina have joined us tonight, and uh, Janice Wisman and uh, all the other real estate staff uh, from Boulder County. You know, we approached them and uh, they fit this into their staff capacity to address this issue for us. Uh, their plates are very full. And um, so I just want to appreciate and thank them for uh, uh, the time that they uh, have already put into it and we'll need to get approval on their end. And uh, all that takes staff time and um, and uh, it was a request on our behalf. So I just want to put a heartfelt thanks out to our friends and partners at Boulder County Open Space, so. Thank you very much, Dan. And yes, thank you everybody who did join. Much appreciated. Um, with that, we are ready to move on to our uh, second main topic, 
uh, this evening, which is a public hearing in consideration of a motion recommending approval of pro proposed open space other land use changes in the Boulder Valley Com Comprehensive Plan uh, within the East Boulder sub-community planning area to the planning board and city council. Um, and I'll so Dan, why don't you tell yeah, us about that one? Yeah, and if somebody wants to uh, work on even a longer motion for the next few minutes, feel free, have at it. Um, by now you all are probably pretty familiar with, with the plan. I think this is our third touch with you uh, uh, on uh, the open space uh, elements uh, involved in the subcommunity plan. And uh, so you'll see some familiar faces join us again with Julia Pinnell, our uh, uh, planner here with Open Space Mountain Parks and Kathleen King with uh, City Planning. So uh, I will turn things over to them again, so. Thanks so much, Dan. So I'm gonna share my screen. Are you all seeing that? Yep. Yes. Great. So um, as Dan mentioned, I will not repeat <laughs> the long-winded reason why we're here yet again. Um, but as he mentioned, uh, Kathleen King is also here. She's the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan Project Lead from Comprehensive Planning. Um, so I'll share some details with you and then she's here to share some additional information and answer any questions you may have. So as we discussed, the purpose of this agenda item is to get OSBT's recommendation to Planning Board and City Council for approval of the proposed open space other land use designation changes within the East Boulder subcommunity planning area to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan or BBCP land use map. The purpose of subcommunity planning is to really take the big citywide goals of the BBCP and consider where and how they can be implemented in a subcommunity at a local level. Land use designations help achieve community desires and contribute to the citywide goals outlined in the BBCP. The BBCP currently includes three categories of open space land use designations that are relevant to the changes being proposed by staff. There is open space acquired or OSA that reflects land that's been acquired by the city for open space purposes, open space development rights or restrictions or OSDR which applies to privately owned land with conservation easements or other development restrictions. And then open space other or OSO, which applies to other public and private land designated prior to 1981 that the city and county would like to preserve. But by itself, this designation does not ensure open space protection. As part of the subcommunity planning process, staff reviewed all of the open space lands within the East Boulder subcommunity area, which has led to staff's recommendations. As some additional context for staff's review and analysis, I wanted to share the long and complex history of OSO and mapping open space. First, prior to 1981, there was a hand-drawn open space map, which only included one category of open space. At this time, the land use designations of OSA, OSDR, and OSO did not exist. The reason for how the boundaries were defined or the type of natural resource values associated with the designations were not recorded. Then in 1990, the open space map was combined with the BBCP land use map, and this was done by hand. Around 1995, the BBCP land use map was digitized. During this process, staff copied what was a hand-drawn broad land use map onto mapping software that was parcel-based and very accurate. This process led to mapping errors and created issues with overlaying the old paper macro scale open space map onto a micro scale digital mapping platform. And this is one of the major reasons why there are misalignments and other types of errors in the BBCP land use map. In 2000, as part of the BBCP major update, OSMP worked with planning to split out the existing open space land use designation to reflect acquired open space and open space development rights holdings. So three more specific open space land use designations were created, open space acquired, open space development rights, and then open space other was created for the other open space that was identified before 1981. So along with creating OSO for the not acquired for, or development restricted open space, two new land use categories were created to be applied moving forward to identify and preserve lands with environmental values. 
These are environmental preservation and natural systems overlay. And these are what, what are applied to lands today. And currently the OSO land use designation boundaries remain the same hand-drawn shape from before 1981. When development is proposed on a private parcel with an OSO land use designation, planning and open space staff evaluate the natural resource values and city charter purposes for open space on the property. Planning staff then considers and issues development permits taking into account OSMP staff opinions on the property accordingly. And this has been done collaboratively through the Development Review Committee or DRC process for more than 20 years. The OSO land use designation has created confusion among the community with regard to the natural resource values present and to OSMP's interest in acquiring and managing the land in perpetuity. As part of the East Boulder subcommunity plan process, two categories of changes to OSO are being proposed. These are corrections from OSO to OSA or OSDR to what are mapping errors from the digitization process and redesignations from OSO to other land use designations to create clarity with regard to open space status of particular properties and OSMP's interest in acquiring and managing the land and also to avoid confusion during the city's development review process. In order for the BBCP land use map to correctly reflect land use status within this planning area, staff is recommending the updates shown on this map, which are also included as attachment A of the memo. The red areas indicate portions of properties that were previously acquired in fee, which should appear as OSA, and the pink areas indicate portions of properties that were previously acquired through conservation easements, which should appear as OSDR. This table corresponds with the land use map on the previous slide and is included as attachment B in the memo. It shows the acreages of portions of properties where proposed changes are recommended. Approximately 4.3 acres of open space that were previously acquired in fee should appear as OSA instead of OSO, while approximately 0.7 acres of portions of open space properties were previously acquired through conservation easements and should appear as OSDR instead of OSO. This map, also included as attachment C in the memo, shows the two locations where staff is proposing redesignating OSO areas to other land use designations. The OSO designation, shown in the middle graphic, is believed to be intended to protect the Boulder and Left Hand and North Boulder Farmers Ditches, as shown in the third graphic in this area near Valmont and 47th Street. The areas adjacent to these ditches were permitted to be developed as shown in the aerial, the first graphic above, and are not of interest to OSMP for preservation. Staff believes that this OSO land use designation was applied more broadly than necessary to meet the intention of protecting these ditches. So we're proposing reducing the existing OSO designation in this area to more accurately overlay the ditch corridors to ensure their continued protection and associated natural resource values. Some areas are already protected by existing easements and will remain as OSDR as shown on the third graphic. Staff also recommends that the already developed lands, including the remaining 12.4 acres of OSO, be changed to a land use designation that better reflects the existing developed conditions. This land use designation will be determined by the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan Land Use Plan, which currently recommends mixed use industrial for this area. The second property where staff is proposing a redesignation of land uses is at 2323 55th Street. The OSO designation shown in the middle graphic is believed to be intended to protect the wetlands on this property. The area adjacent to this wetland was permitted to be developed as shown in the aerial, the first graphic above, and is not of interest to OSMP for preservation due to the already developed lands. Staff believes that the pre-1981 OSO designation was applied more broadly than necessary to meet the intention of protecting this resource. So we're proposing reducing the size of the OSO designation to cover only the wetlands on the western portion of the property. Staff is recommending the remaining two acres of OSO, the already developed lands, be changed to a land use designation that better reflects the existing developed conditions. This land use designation will be determined by the East Boulder Subcommunity Land Use Plan, which currently recommends light industrial for this area. And at last month's board meeting, um, the board requested information about the development history of each of these areas where staff is proposing land use, res uh, land use redesignations. So I'm going to turn things over to Kathleen so that she can share what staff has since learned about this history. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so yeah, last time we met, um, there were some questions about um, these properties history. And so we looked into, we looked into that history a little bit. Um, and so, you know, this property or these properties at Valmont and 47th Street were annexed into the city in 1978 as part of ordinance 4367. The properties were originally zoned for industrial use and a car dealership is an allowed use within this area. So the development on, and use on the site were likely um, by right, which means that the development and use as a car dealership with, was, was within the zoning for this area, requiring no site or discretionary review by the city or associated boards. The property owner would have needed a, a building permit and building inspectors would have ensured that the city's code regulations and standards for development were followed during construction. This development history has not changed staff's recommendation for the area. And if you go to the next one, um, then you know through, through our research, uh, staff discovered that the property which houses the Boulder Valley Humane Society was annexed into the city in 1972 as part of um, ordinance 3808. And this ordinance wasn't available in the, the city records and laser fiche, but um, given that most all of the zoning in the area is some form of industrial, it may um, be of a similar history. So animal clinics and shelters are an allowed use in the area. So it's likely that the development and use on this site was also by right and did not require review by planning board, but would have been required to follow all city standards for development. And so, you know, in this case as well, the development history um, hasn't changed staff's recommendation for the area. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Um, so that's our presentation and we're happy to answer any clarifying questions. Um, and the staff recommendation is included on this slide just for your reference. Thank you very much, uh, Juliet and Kathleen. Um, much appreciated on the feedback from the prior presentation and the research requests. Um, with that, let's open it up to questions uh, from the board. Michelle. Hey, um, thanks for that presentation. I have a question um, regarding the Valmont. Uh, it sounds like some of the ditches are protected in a separate way, and then some of them we just want to leave the OSDR to protect those ditches. Is, is, is that right? Am I understanding that right? That some of them are protected, um, and I forget the terminology, but on its own, but we want to leave the OSDR for continued protection. Is there any way to make those designations similar, but same? So the ditches are protected in the same way? Or is that like way too much out of this, out of this process? Just trying to get the OSO part right. So, and I can bring this, as you can see on, on this slide, this kind of shows, I think, what you're asking. So we've got, um, so easements are already over protecting the ditch corridors um, where it's OSDR um, in these sections. And so what we're recommending currently is leaving OSO on the areas of the ditches that don't have that already built in OSDR. Um, so that's why we're proposing leaving OSO over that section as that kind of trigger for us to take a look if um, development is proposed in that area. Um, so that's kind of the, the reasoning behind that proposal. Does that make sense? Right, so some of them are already protected by easements, but the OSO portions are not. And that's how we're gonna Correct. leave it there. And we can't, I guess I, what I was trying to ask is could we make uh, but that's probably a way bigger question is to protect them via easements con contiguously. That would, that would be a land negotiation conversation. And, yeah, and right. uh, the ditch uh, companies um, also, you know, have inherent rights over these areas. So to be honest, the department is not concerned that the ditch will go away. Um, and so uh, in all likelihood, these probably would not rise to a priority for our real estate team to uh, put a lot of staff capacity into trying to negotiate an acquisition of some sort of these areas, uh, just due to the nature of 
of feeling pretty confident that, you know, the, the inherent ditch easements that are there, even though they're not city easements, the ditch companies have the rights, uh, also sort of add that layer of protection to these, air, to these areas. Caroline. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And um, this question might be for Dan, we'll see. I think I'm kind of um, colloquying off of what Michelle said in understanding how it, it benefits us to keep the OSO over it if we're not really interested in them, um, if that's confusing to the public. Because I went and walked all of the ditches. So it's apparent that they're all taken care of in various ways by various um, people. There's no um, uh, parallel care between um, any of the areas that we were looking at. So we're not gonna coordinate or oversee the work done by private contractors, right? So like the BMW dealership, whatever lawn they company they use to do their area versus another place. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of confused of like the, the benefit of, of doing it the way that we're proposing. I, I just feel like I still don't quite understand. If I could clarify, I think what you're asking is why don't we use this as an opportunity to not have any OS, OS designation at all on, on these not protected slivers of land is to remove OSO designation completely off these. Yeah, uh, like does, does that benefit us or, or not or yeah. Well, it's something that we certainly could take a look at at the uh, major update portion in 2025. Um, uh, typically that would be a time that we would, we, we could look at those type of issues. Like I said, right now, the OSO and Kathleen correct, or Bethany, correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, the OSO would not, um, is, is in this case would just be, uh, an alert system basically to city staff and to open space staff that if there was anything that pr proposed to, that would be unforeseen that could disturb this, the ditch corridor area, the OSO would be something that the planning staff would sort of, it would tip them off that there's something here and they would bring the open space staff into it. So that's really probably the only value um, out there, but I asked Kathleen and Bethany if they have any other colloquy on that one. Yeah, I can, uh, just real quick, uh, I jumped on, I can tell you, you know, the scenic easements that exist along those corridors were basically dedicated during some development process. And so this leaving open space uh, again, I mean, OSO again, along those ditch corridors could trigger us to really do that, that analysis again in the future and say, you know, if they're proposing development that gets near or encroaches on those ditch corridors and working with the ditch company, you know, there could be the extra protection negotiated during the, the development process. Um, and, and additional scenic easements or, or ditch easements um, or some sort of open space easement put on those corridors at that time um, as part of the kind of negotiation that, that Dan um, discussed. So I, I think this is a good step rather than, you know, as far as just that trigger of, you know, looking at the need to, to ensure those, those corridors are still um, uh, per, you know, and the, the, the water utility itself or the, the, the water, um, uh, uh, the, the state of the water corridor is, is continued to be protected, whether it's, you know, just via the ditch, the existing ditch easement or warrants further protection, um, during a development process. Is that, does that help in your question, Caroline? Yeah, it was just kind of understanding like where the responsibility would lie. So like, you know, they'll do like drainage way hazard assessments. And if there ever was a problem and, um, you know, the community was upset about it because we did not act on it and we do have it classified as OSO. Um, but what I'm hearing, we were, we're kind of a step back as far as just leaving this as like a, a maybe blanket of protection in the future. Um, so I guess just that understanding of of perhaps it could help us in the future, but how much of a liability is it now or not really at all? Um, just kind of those different factors weighing out um, the importance think, of it. I'd like to jump in. My question is, is tangential on that um, for Bethany and Juliet. Um, I am a believer that these uh, ditch corridors are veins of life-giving blood to our ecosystems 
certainly merit the ongoing monitoring of the department. Um, my concern is more about how you arrived at the chosen width of the corridor and how are we being assured that those corridor widths are gonna be applied consistently throughout the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan so as not to preferentially benefit certain developers or landowners and that we're being consistent with the amount of land we say merits our oversight. Juliet, did, Juliet or Kathleen, you wanna jump on, on that or do you want me to? So I, I can start and you can definitely add Bethany. Um, so kind of standard, we kind of have, do have standards that we start with as far as the width to go by and that's the same as the existing easements. And so we did touch base with all our natural resource staff um, just to confirm that that is, they believe that that's adequate for to protect those resources that you mentioned. Um, and they, they assured us that yes, what we were using there absolutely is. And as far as the kind of broadening out to other areas, that's absolutely going to be, um, that's something that we're going to be taking into consideration um, if and when we get to the um, full BBCP major update. Um, but for right now, we're just kind of focusing in this area and what we're doing in this area is consistent with um, everything else within this area and kind of our standards around um, ditch protection. And what's that footage? Uh, is it, Bethany, correct me if I'm wrong, is it 25 on either side, 25 feet either side of this? Yeah, side? so um, Hal, what you're asking, so typically in the state of Colorado, if you don't have a formal easement um, uh, or or some uh, or some other documentation or reasoning, a, a prescribed uh, ditch corridor right tends to be 30 feet, so 15 feet each side. Um, the the easements, many of the the easements, um, the the ditch companies through Boulder will uh, state that they have kind of uh, that that they need 50 feet, and so in this and 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 we're okay with the OSO doing 50 feet, 25 feet each side. Um, as, as kind of that, that area. Um, we did discuss, does that in any way kind of identify or agree that they have a 50 foot right where they might only actually have a prescribed 30 foot right. And it doesn't, it doesn't provide any kind of um, formal, you know, ditch or, or formal, mm -hmm. formal conveyance of a right that they don't already have. Is that, does that help? Yeah, no, I, I, I certainly understand it. I just think um, for consistency right. through the plan, we'd be wise to, to settle in on that number yep. and keep working on it. And I've just heard 50 feet, so I'll be there at the next uh, BVCP major update, remembering that one. Um, thank you. That's a good, straightforward answer. Sure. I might just mention, you know, I think it's kind of a theme um, that I'm hearing from all of the board members about a desire for um, consistent treatment um, for ditches in how we approach them in our land use mapping. And that's certainly a conversation that we've been having and has been really revealed through this process. And so we'll continue to look at it. Great. Karen? I understand that, that um, this process that we're in the midst of tonight is being driven by trying to get accurate maps. Um, and, um, and, and so I, my questions involve differences in the maps that you've given us. On page four for agenda item four, there are the three maps of Valmont and 47th, the existing aerial view, the current Boulder Valley Comp Plan View and the proposed OSO DR um, map. And then on attachment A, there's a different view of the uh, ditch corridors that we've been talking about. In the one that's shown on proposed OSO DR mixed use industrial, it shows two OSO DR areas. On attachment A, it only shows one OSO DR area. 
So my first question in a series of questions is what happened to the other OSDR in the Valmont and 47th Street area? Why is it not shown on attachment A? I can answer this, I think. Um, so the OS on attachment, I'm looking at the maps here, Karen. <laughs> um, on attachment A, the sliver of purple near Sterling is because that was a correction. The other OSDR did not need to be corrected on that ditch, it already existed. So this map A is just showing the corrections from where it was OSO to OSDR OS A. So the other OSDR that are along the ditches needed no corrections, they were already showing up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, then let me go on to the 55th Street property. Let me, let me just say that was Casey French for the record. Thank you very much. Yes. Just making sure we're introducing everybody. Sorry about that. Um, on attachment A on the 55th Street property, um, I don't know how to describe this, but the, the, the property that is the, uh, it appears to be a, a right angle sliver on the southwest corner of the Humane Society property is uh, is not shown in red. It's shown in light green as open space acquired. And I want to understand why there's no red there if, if the objective of our considerations tonight is accuracy and mapping, I wanna make sure that it's accurately shown. Julia, I can, I can jump in again if you'd like. I believe, Karen, I think if you look at attachment three, why it's not shown as a correction is because it's already being accurately shown as that sliver as OSA. Um, I think in attachment C, I think it's a little bit more clear that the parcel that we're speaking of is, is north of that. I think it's more clearly illustrated on that one map. Then why, why are the red lines around the acquired open space So I think that the mapping the errors of the Humane Society yeah. shown. Yeah, I think the sliver just didn't, it was showing correctly. And where you see the red lines is where you see the mapping errors from that transposition from those slivers. So that, that little green sliver that was just showing up accurately. Well, on attachment A, the red lines is where it, where it, where it is not. I'm hoping, hoping I'm explaining myself well enough to split between the two, Karen. Yeah, these are a little bit tricky. I'll just jump in and add some clarification. These are a little bit tricky because most of the properties here on attachment A are showing up correctly. It's just the slivers, tiny slivers of the property that are showing up in red that somehow didn't make it into getting categorized accurately as OSA where most of the property is accurately reflected. It's just those tiny slivers. Okay, so you feel confident that we're not introducing more errors in this set of documents that we have tonight? Yes. Okay, then um, I'll hold my other comment till later on in the agenda. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Karen. If we don't have, oh, Dave, you have a clarifier? No, I have a comment, so I'll hold up. Okay, thank you. We, I think, are ready to take the uh, public hearing portion of this. If there are no more clarifying questions, we'll come back uh, and fully deliberate shortly. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Jean. 
Great, thanks, Hal. Okay, um, if there are folks that would like who would like to speak uh, to this item, if you could please use the raise hand function now. I know we had at least one that messaged me in the chat, um, but I'm not seeing the raise hand. Lynn, are you here? And did you want to speak to this item? Yes, okay, cool. We've got hand raised now. Okay, um, and again, we'll have um, two minutes for public speaking. Lynn, you should be able to unmute. You can go ahead. I was just waiting for someone else to speak first because I came to the meeting late, couldn't get the agenda, and um, I wanted to be able to be as informed as I could. Um, sorry about that. Um, I, I recommend against the change on 55th Street from, um, to, from it being mostly OSO, I mean, it's all OSO to something else. So I think that gives us the best options in the future since um, OSO allows us to acquire it if we feel we need to. Um, and um, I'm, I'm recalling the map designations that were um, off on the 311 project. And it was very disturbing because there was one elder surveyor who disagreed with the changes between the digital and the old maps. And I think it's best that we hold on to our OSO as much as we can. And if, if I might ask for the, for the um, um, allowance of me to speak on general matters because I couldn't make the meeting at the beginning, I wanted to request that open space consider weighing in on Rocky Flats. I know this is not in your area, but we have a lot of mountain bikers that may be going out there and their health is at risk right now. And there was a map chosen that would avoid Rocky Flats that was not considered. There was no public hearing with city council. So I recommend that open space recommend to city council that they, they, they consider this more openly. Um, we do have people coming from Boulder going there and that puts our residents at risk. And also we have much more demand for space especially considering potential of CU coming here for each per capita person, you know, each person in Boulder to have open space and um, it's getting very tight, so. Thank um, you very much, Lynn. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, Dave, I know you are holding a general comment. Um, as we turn to deliberations, I'd like to uh, perhaps start off uh, just in framing this for myself, I am uh, deeply interested and have been in a long time in the issue of open space other in the city of Boulder. Um, I will be supporting this uh, staff recommendation in its entirety, and I just wanted to explain a little bit why. Um, OSO, I see originally as the community's ambition in conservation and preservation. And it certainly remains so um, as various errors have flown into that uh, mapping over the years. My analysis of the situation is that in certain instances, OSO designations that rightly were placed over ecosystems that had tremendous value to the community were jeopardized by the confusion about the designation OSO itself. And frankly, by fixing parts where there is no ecosystem value, we more credibly lay claim to the eventual acquisition and protection of those remaining lands that increasingly have been questioned in certain development projects. So I see, um, despite a shrinkage in the amount of ground covered, it is not a shrinkage in our ambition to continue protecting these uh, important parcels but it is more um, simply a, uh, it adds to our credibility 
when we do go to those remaining OSO par parcels that are important and have unique um, ecosystem characteristics. So I just wanted to start with, put my view right on the table with that. That's what's on my mind. Dave, you have comments here too. Uh, I'll, I'll make a contrasting view. Um, and that is, uh, I have a rather jaundiced perspective of the OSO designation. And the irony is, is that I do agree, Hal, that, you know, it, it uh, represents the, a, a point in time that people were, you know, concerned and ambitious about protecting areas. But the irony is, is that the city is the worst offender of uh, diminishing the OSO designation. And I think we're we're seeing we're seeing re, uh, results of that right now, and one of the concerns I have about ditches per se, and I I don't agree that there's much e ecological value with certainly uh, some of the ditches that we're looking at right now, but my major concern is that uh, the city can put a ditch into a pipe at any time that it deems that is warranted. And so when we say, oh, the ditches, and I do agree, the ditches have, you know, not extraordinary, but high ecological value in certain cases. And, and they are very vital to, you know, semi-arid landscape. But the fact of the matter is, is that the city uh, cares very little in my estimation about uh, the importance of OSO designations. Can I ask a question directly back to you, though, Dave? Doesn't leaving a corridor of OSO over the ditch provide a layer of protection against its eventual undergrounding, et cetera? Well, the ditch company the, are private landowners. And from my perspective, um, you know, the, the ditches are protected just, you know, by state law and just because of, you know, the ditch company ownership. Um, when it's desired to put it into a pipe, or, or bury it, uh, I, I uh, tend to think that you know, perhaps uh, it depends on the ditch company's preferences, but they probably see that as a benefit because it requires less management um, over time. And so it's not entirely a, a city um, issue, but I think in general, uh, the concern about uh, certain ditches in these developed areas is that, um, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of uh, environmental value associated with them any longer. And the city is, is primarily responsible, I think, for the diminishment of the importance of those OSO designations. So I have mixed feelings about this. I do agree that it's worth correcting, you know, the mapping errors or mistakes uh, or anomalies um, but as far as assigning high ecological value to a lot of these areas, uh, I think uh, we're way past that. Fair enough. Caroline, I see your hand up too. Um, just kind of speaking directly to what you said, in this area, there are portions of the uh, left-hand ditch that are in a pipe and underground. There was a new um, development built, so these ditches are not... Um, you know, open and out in, in all portions. So what what Dave was saying has happened in, in the exact area we're talking about. Yeah, and the, yes, best, I, the best example is actually Silver Lake Ditch in North Boulder, the North Boulder Community Park, that the Silver Lake Ditch all the way out to uh, Mesa Reservoir on uh, Boulder Valley Ranch open space used to be, you know, a traditional open ditch and it was put into a pipe basically from, you know, around the Wonderland Lake area, all the way out uh, past Broadway and US 36. So anyway, uh, I just, I, I, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse, uh, metaphorically speaking, but I think the city is the worst offender as far as the diminishment of the importance of these OSO designations. Um, I'll just call quick on that quickly, Dave. I, I tend to agree with you in that general summary. However, I see us with a simple decision at hand, which is we, we either 
the, the OSO that is overlaid on these ditches is now wrongly over development and the ditch. The real options are we, we grant the, the OSO corridor over the ditch and retain OSO in there, covered or uncovered in its current state, and represent as a board our insistence on, on consistent treatment of ditches with OSO designation, which per, perhaps prevents elsewhere in the system, you know, in other BVCB updates, um, it, 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 to remove it entirely, I see we lose all ability to protect it from undergrounding. Keeping it as an OSO designated corridor allows us to lobby for daylighting for enhancement over time, for beautification. Um, and so I see no benefit to waiving the designation. Yeah, I don't, I'm not suggesting that. I, I'm just saying that I, I think realistically, and when you look historically, that uh, there have been some issues associated with the OSO designation. And, you know, one of the things I think that um, I'm, I'm concerned about is that, um, the confusion because it, again, it looks like, you know, the open space and mountain parks department should have a role in managing these areas. And in fact, um, that's not the case. And, and so historically, uh, I think that we've got to figure out uh, a better approach to the role of the open space and mountain parks department in its relationship to the OSO designation. Thank you. Karen? Uh, I have two comments. Uh, the first is for Kathleen. I thought you had previously said that there was consultation when the planning department received a request for doing something with an OSO piece of property. Did I misunderstand that? No, that's right. When um, proposals come in or projects come in and there's OSO designation um, on the land, as, as Dan was describing earlier, it's kind of a red flag for planning staff to coordinate with OSMP, talk about the, um, the environmental values of, of whatever land is designated designated OSO, and then um, in the case of ditches, recommend that the um, property owner coordinate with the ditch company and kind of follow up to make sure that that happens. Um, so th that's correct. We, we do in the development review process, certainly coordinate with OSMP staff um, on any projects that have an open space designation on them. And if, if the OSMP staff said, um, that dish, ditch is important, it should not be undergrounded or put in a pipe, then what role does the planning department have as the next step? Well, so um, ditches and ditch companies uh, have, you know, I think different um, rules maybe and if Bethany's still in, she could probably speak to this better better than I do, but um, ditch companies are um, sort of similar to the railroad in their power to make decisions about their own um, property without the, um, uh, oversight's not the word, but without the intervention of, of probably the city. Um, but I might, I might ask Bethany to jump in because um, she knows more about Detroit's than I do. This is a hearing of the Department of the Defense Budget Posture for New. Somebody attending two hearings? What's. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm not in the defense hearing. Yeah, I, mean, I, I don't think Bethany heard that. No, that was. A, no, I, I saw Lynn, Lynn's thing jump up, but I was just trying to unmute, uh, <laughs> having some problems because I think I had my headphones on. Um, so uh, it, it's it, your your question is is very complex. So Ditch Company has the it really has the dominant right. And so if 
if um, a development uh, scenario proposed um, uh, culverting, I mean, uh, uh, piping a ditch, uh, the ditch company would have uh, really the first ability to give any kind of permission to do that um, or and allow it or very much say we don't want it. Um, and they actually don't like their ditches piped a lot because, um, you know, you have to have uh, access points for, for maintenance and you have to have clean outs and things like that. And so um, they, but they would have the, the dominant right and the dominant interest um, and be the first in that, you know, that, that tree of consultation. Um, and then open space, you know, you've got to read the definition of open space other because it doesn't, ha it doesn't hold a ton of weight when it's still in private ownership. So again, you've got the fee title owner, let's say a commercial, you know, a commercial office park or a, a, in this, a, you know, a, a car dealership. You've got a ditch going through there. You've got the ditch's interest um, that really, as far as that ditch corridor is the, is the, uh, the, the ruling factor. And then you've got open space that because it has open space other, we can say, you know, it'd be really great if you kept that an open, an open and natural state. Um, but really, if they agree, no development, the ditch company either allows it or doesn't allow it to be piped, those three levels, we don't have a lot of say while it's in kind of the, the private, private development scenario. But again, the open space other is important to trigger those conversations and potentially those compromises during a development project. So in your historical analysis, you guys, did you see where open space consultation occurred in the specific properties that we're addressing tonight in the no. past? I have not been able to track that down. Um, Kathleen, did you, we have not seen that in our realm. Um, the, the, the designation and the development took place really, really close in the, I think late seventies is what we were talking about. And so um, Kathleen, were you able to find any of the the designation versus the development of those like 47th street parcels and such? Um, no, and they did not go through, you know, as, as we kind of mentioned in that um, presentation, those were by right development. Oh, so they would right. not have gone through a site review process. Yeah. And that's typically um, the process that um, really flags those different um, triggers. Right. One, one thing I think is fairly clear um, as, as this board uh, entertains these essentially concessions and contraction in open space, it comes with a request that that red flag you referred to is well oiled and is standing <laughs> up at the times when it is supposed to be used. Um, that's at least part of my understanding of this arrangement. And, and it is, I mean, around the city, you know, our role on development review, if it, if it comes in for site plan or, or annexation or anything like that, the, the OSO flag goes up very quickly. Thank you. Caroline? Um, this question is for Dan. It's kind of to play devil's advocate off of what Hal said. So Hal likes the idea, if I heard him right, of OSO still overlaying the ditches for um, consistent treatment of the ditches. But I feel like what I'm hearing is that the ditches do what they want with their ditches. Um, we're not really there to coordinate or oversee anything. So while it, it would be nice if OSO allowed um, consistent treatment of ditches, it, is it fair to say that it doesn't? Or what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I think I'll just go back to the fact that we'll have a seat at the table. And whether that seat at the table has a lot of weight or not a, weight, a lot of weight or whether or not we can be influential in an outcome, um, every, every specific case will be different. But uh, what the OSO allows us to do, if we've applied it consistently, is it to at least be at the table when discussions are happening about the future use um, of that area that is OSO. So that's... That's the benefit. I think Bethany explained it well as far as in certain cases, especially when ditch companies are involved, you know, we may take third fiddle, um, but we're at least invited to dinner. And I think that's sort of the benefit. So with that portion that I was talking about that was recently, um, the ditch was moved and shifted to allow for this new build. Um, you could go there and like look at it and, and know that it happened very recently. Were, do you, um, remember any portion of this um, 
coming to us and saying, hey, we're, we're actually going to tunnel some of this? Like, were we at the table for, for that portion that I'm speaking of that was rerouted and tunneled? Yeah, I don't have any specific knowledge of that. Um, so that's not ringing anything in my mind, but I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure, Caroline, um, what, which area you're speaking of, but again, I suspect either if it was due to a new development or new build, it was, it was a buy right development. So it, that doesn't trigger the OSO consultation. And then it, it's just a discussion really between the developer and the ditch company and, you know, the ditch company, obviously, if it's been, if it's been um, piped recently, they, they must have allowed it. I do know if you're talking um, also, you know, there's a, a good scenario also is over kind of the new development near gun barrel. I mean, uh, called not gun barrel, um, diagonal crossing. That's kind of the island in the iris diagonal kind of area. Um, that ditch was, you know, there's a ditch lateral there um, that was not OSO, um, but was allowed to be, was allowed to be um, piped in order to put the development in. And that was a negotiation with OSMP, with the developer, with the ditch company and such. So we do, again, it, it, it all really depends on the, the development standard and the code requirements and things. But if it's a buy right development, that's, that's really the only time this doesn't take place. If, if people thought it would be helpful um, before um, entertaining the motion itself, we could do a brief straw poll to see if there was any will to waive o OSO across ditches. I think we will find that there is not that will, but I'd be delighted to do it if that's what we need to proceed. Is it, Karen? I, I wanna bring up a separate topic. Okay. Um, do, do, you, do, you, do you feel that a further discussion, are you interested in waiving OSO across ditches? No. Okay. D Dave, where do you stand on that? Yeah, I'm not, in, I'm not interested in that. I'm just okay. pointing out the irony of it. But. Yep. No, I, I understand. Okay. With that, let's move to your next comment, Karen. I, I am in favor of cleaning up these mapping uh, issues that that we're being presented with. Um, I just want to say before we come to the vote that because I have gone out and observed the uh, situation on the boundaries of the 55th Street property, that I think it's very important that OSMP uh, gets out there and um, does what needs to be done to establish the open space acquired property as open space land, which is being used by a whole bunch of other people in unregulated ways right now. And that's a concern to me. Especially given that these mapping corrections. Okay. Does anybody have any uh, final core hesitancies on this or, or anything that's preventing them from moving towards support? Okay, I guess um, with that, why don't we uh, please pull up the staff recommended motion? And um, I took the honor last time. If anyone else would like it, that's fine. I'm, Michelle, is that your hand? I'll do it. Um, I'd like to make a motion to recommend to Planning Board and City Council to approve for approval of the proposed OSO land use designation changes within the East Boulder Subcommunity Planning Area to the BVCP land use map. I will second that. Um, and so we will um, hold the official vote here. Karen. Yes. Thank you. Dave. Yes. Caroline. Yes. Michelle. Yes, and I also vote affirmatively. So that is unanimous. Um, Juliet, thank you very much. Uh, Bethany, Kathleen, everybody in your involvement. 
Um, certainly appreciate the uh, consistent, uh, excellent work there, looking at the, the small ecosystem value that did remain. Um, and we look forward to seeing a lot more 50 foot swaths on ditches around the whole plant. Thank you. You're still lobbying so Hal, aren't you? <laughs> Just remember, Hal, ditch companies are like railroads. <laughs> I, I'm just a gambler, and that means I never give up something for nothing. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, with that, uh, that's wonderful. Dan, I'm going to turn things back over to you um, in matters from the department. Yeah, well, uh, the big item tonight, other than some verbal updates after this, is we are in budget season, and so uh, this will be our second touch of several to come, and our service area for central services, um, Lauren Kilcoin, and then Sam McQueen, business services manager, will lead us through the dis this discussion, so turn it over to them. Thanks, everyone. And um, I'm so thrilled to introduce Samantha McQueen to the team. Sam joined us back in March as our business services manager. So over time, Sam will transition to being your primary point of contact on the budget. Uh, but, but for tonight, and I, I expect for the next several months, we'll share that responsibility in, in developing the memo and bringing things forward to you. But just to introduce Sam uh, briefly, Sam has been with the finance department for the last couple of years as a senior budget analyst. And before that was doing similar work for DC public schools. Uh, my fun fact for Sam is that before her life in finance, she was a chemistry and biology teacher. So I'm hoping that this job gets to combine the best of both worlds for her. And we are thrilled to add her skills and talents to the team. So um, we're gonna go through the draft CIP tonight. I'll take some of the slides. So we'll Sam and, and we'll wrap it up with questions. So let me just share my PowerPoint. So you all uh, are familiar with the city process by now. Um, Michelle from, from previous boards and, and this slide will look familiar to those of you who have been on the board. Um, and back in April, we provided you with written information as a first touch on the CIP. And that looked a little bit different this year than it has in years past. In the past, we would have been talking about work plan priorities and we did that. But really what I wanted to get across in the April packet was the impact of COVID on revenues and on our work plan as a way to set the stage for now what we're bringing forward to you in the draft CIP. So this is not the only conversation we'll be having about the CIP. We'll be back next month with refinements based on this conversation. And we expect a ton more information to be coming from the finance department between now and June around revenues and uh, different components of our budget. So, so we'll be integrating all of that and, and bringing something back to you in June. We then switched gears in July and August to talking about the operating budget. Um, and then concurrently, we start to move into an external part of our budget work where we're working with the executive budget team, the planning board, um, city council. So there's a lot going on at once. It's about a 10 month process overall from when we start internally to do our work to when city council looks at things in the fall. So um, tonight is, is the second of, of five overall touches on the budget for 2022. For tonight's presentation, I want to spend some time on process, which is maybe a little bit tedious um, and a little bit definitional, but because we're going to spend so much time together over the next several months, I just want to lock down really what the point is of this meeting compared with July and talk about the different components of our budget. We'll just state the goal of the, the business meeting. I'll turn it over to Sam for forecasts and trends, and then she'll hand it back to me for some CIP project highlights. So first, this is very basic um, and probably something you all know, but open, the Open Space Fund is a special revenue government fund for the city. So that means that our fund, the Open Space Fund, is util utilized specifically for open space purposes by the Open Space Mountain Parks Department. Over the last several years, we've had a lot of opportunities to streamline what that means, and we've tried to take those opportunities as they've come up. So um, those of you who have been around for a while might remember the the general fund paying us for some real estate stuff, but we were then turning that around to pay for some help from Wildland Fire and getting a general fund transfer. 
and a lot of complicated interfund allocations. And so we're at a place now where we've been able to clean up most of that practice. Some of those events ended, some have been, um, we've just had an opportunity to do things through MOU instead of through a fund accounting. And what remains now is that all of our budget with the exception of about 428,000 a year in lottery funding comes from the open space fund. So our goal is always to uphold the best practices and fund stewardship. You're gonna hear me talk a lot about being fiscally conservative, making sure our increases to budget are sustainable, making sure that we're telling the budget story in a transparent way. Although our team has accounting and finance expertise, we don't often lean on that for these type of presentations. We wanna make sure that it's clear how budget connects to the master plan. For example, um, we wanna make sure that there's, a, there's an easy to understand clear um, uh, communication around how dollars are, are supporting on the ground programs and projects. So um, overall the fund financial, which is not in your packet tonight, but will be over the next few months, it, is, can, it, it, makes, uh, it starts with revenues as you would expect. There's a section on expenditures and then reserves. So I wanna to touch on each of those things really briefly before we do a deeper dive into the CIP. So on the revenue side, we know that the majority of the open space fund revenue is from sales and use taxes. The forecasts for how we, how we start to think about like what, re what will revenues look like in 2022? What is a multi-year recovery from COVID looking like? What's the six year outlook? Those come from the finance department and the finance department is partnering with economists and with CU and looking at um, local, state, national revenues um, in order to give us those projections. So they're updated annually and through COVID they're updated a lot more frequently than that because we we're trying to figure out what's going on. We are still waiting for the 2022 revenue projections to come in. We think they're gonna be coming in next week. So we've made some assumptions here around our expenditures and, and the scale of our CIP based on what we know from our last revenue updates last year. Uh, but we, we know that those will be updated and that is something that finance owns um, in generating for the budget process. The other revenues, the non-sales and use tax revenues, the, those are estimated by Sam, Cole, myself, the team, based on, um, we look at actual performance, we look at the consumer price index, which is a proxy for inflation. We looked at uh, approved plans. So when are we gonna be renegotiating leases, things like that. And, and we're having that discussion of then what do we think is gonna happen next year and over six years to some of those revenue categories. And in the April packet at your request from the retreat, we tried to break out those revenues a little bit more clearly than we've done in the past. So you can see program specific revenues, um, you can see the agriculture and water and caretaker lease revenues. So, so hopefully that helped to, to paint a better picture than what we did last year. So the CIP that we're gonna talk about is based on best current information, understanding that we'll need to come with refinements next month. On the expenditure side, we are going to talk about our budget in terms of the capital improvement program, the CIP, and then the operating budget. So what is a capital improvement program? We, we try our best to fit into citywide definitions and categories for CIP. So the definition, as you would see in the budget book, is a CIP is for the maintenance and enhancement of public infrastructure for discrete projects over 50,000 or for projects of the same type totaling more than 50,000. So as that relates to us, when those categories were created, we weren't necessarily thinking about habitat restoration or the confluence area or things that open space would consider to be major capital expenditures. So we're frequently retrofitting into those categories. We also have a practice of, I would say lumping projects by type. So something like fencing, for example, you'll see a request in for I think 125,000 that's made up of many smaller fencing projects across the system. We do that for a number of reasons. One is to be able to attract vendors. And so we're, we're much more likely to get bids from fencing companies when there's assurance of, of, of a, a greater scale of work to be performed. Um, and we also know that we have flexibility across the system when we do that. So in any given year, um, one fencing project might become more urgent, something might happen, we need to get out there. And it gives us a level of flexibility to say, overall, we're gonna make a big capital investment in fencing. And some of the sites might shift between now and January, 2022, when these dollars come online. So um, the last comment on this topic is that we also have a lot of multi-year projects where individually in a given year, we might not re 
reach that 50K threshold, but over the course of the project, we will. So an example in your packet would be uh, Fort Chambers, where in the current year it's funded at 100, in 2022, we're looking at 20K, but we're looking at the total cost it's gonna take to implement on that work, and that's what makes it a capital project. So um, I think it's very easy to dive way into the weeds on a lot of these projects, uh, but if we can kind of up level and zoom out a little bit, the CIP represents about 18% of our overall budget for 2022. So the reason that we're spending so much time on it relative to the operating budget, which is the vast majority of our budget, is because it's, it's made up of these discrete projects that are finishing every year and then we're kind of on to new projects and there's new things to talk about compared with ongoing programs, ongoing projects, personnel expenditures that are less agile and they change a lot less frequently in any given year. So overall, what we're talking about tonight is not a major source of department expenditures, but it is the most flexible. So um, we put a lot of time every year into generating that project list. The operating budget on the other hand, so that's where you're looking at core services, day-to-day -day operations, um, things to keep the lights on, pay the bills, make sure staff have equipment, make sure our fleet's in good shape, things like that. <laughs> Excuse me. And the way that that's structured, um, and we'll talk about this more in July and August, is first we're looking at standard and non-standard personnel expenditures. So of our, my estimate right now, which could change is like 29.2 million for next year, about 15 million of that is salaries, whether that's standard, seasonal, temporary. Then we talk about our non-personnel budget for ongoing programs, our annual debt payments, and our cost allocation. We have heard from the finance department that there's gonna be no increase to cost allocation in the current year or next year, which is wonderful news for us as we do our budget planning. So operating is really the majority of expenditures. That's what we're gonna focus on July and August. And, and for, this, for this meeting, we're really um, zoned in on the CIP. <clears throat> the last part that I'll mention here in terms of budget structure is reserves. And these, depending on the fund in the city, there's a range of practices around how to manage reserves because we are so sales tax dependent. We're very um, subject to cyclic economic conditions. If there were a recession, if there are any major impact to sales and use tax, like what we saw last year, we know that we are more impacted than the average fund in the city by things like that. And so um, we keep a, a relatively high 20% contingency reserve. We also know after the last um, 10 years or so that we are very impacted by emergencies. So very impacted by the flood, we know we had a number of fires last year where we were impacted in staffing the EOC and, and responding. So those reserves are available to us should we need to tap into them. There are a couple of off cycle methods where we might be taking budget action outside of the process I just described. One is adjustment, the, the, the capital carryover adjustment to base where um, if we had a multi-year project and construction was going to take a number of years we would take the leftover money from last year and bring it forward into this year to be able to use. Um, and the other option for adjustment to base is if there's unplanned or emergent revenues or expenditures. So we have the opportunity to incorporate that into the budget at two different points throughout the year. So my last slide before I hand it off to Sam is around um, CIP development in the department. So I've been talking about the city and if we take a next level down really the way that we're coming up with these projects and um, deciding on what we think is the best for the CIP for any given year, where our, our work planning process is gonna be, is gonna be the, the central point in making those decisions. And, and many of you have heard me talk about this over the years, um, but we probably have about 400 staff hours into developing the project list that you see uh, in your packet. And that's a combination of things. So we're doing intake with subject matter experts and project managers. We're looking at our department priorities, our plan commitments. How do we scale back projects so we're only asking for what we need so we can maximize the amount of work we're doing? How do we phase things? Where do we have staff capacity? And our goal is let's say yes to the highest priority projects and no to the ones that aren't ready. So this year, a couple of changes. We still have our work plan steering team, but we spent a lot more time at the service area level, working with PMs, working with supervisors, generating that like wish list of projects to then bring to the broader conversation and, and start to do that priority work. So 
uh, my personal feeling, and I think the department's feeling, is that this list of projects is really solid um, and, and the result of months now of very intentional work. So uh, we hope that you feel the same way. So I will hand it off to Sam. Thanks, Lauren. Lauren, um, may I ask just a quick question before you go on? Yeah. You, you mentioned that, that we don't do fund accounting anymore for uh, our commitments, for instance, with, with wild, wildland fire uh, group. And we do that through MOUs. What does that mean in terms of how the money goes back and forth between, because isn't there still money exchanged between OSMP and wildland fire? Um, it would be on a, on a per project basis. So as an example, we used to pay okay. 0.78 of a wildland fire chief's FTE. Um, we, we no longer do that. So, so the general fund now supports that full FTE but we provide a lot of other in-kind services around training or operation and, and repair of a brush truck, making sure we're equipping red carded staff, um, that we can meet a commitment around a certain number of red carded employees or squad bosses or engine bosses, things like that. So we've worked it out through the MOU to be an equivalent contribution without having to exchange dollars back and forth. By specifying projects within the MOU. Yes, and, and, and I suppose expenditure type. So um, we would have a brush truck or a water truck or whatever it might be, and we would make the commitment to pay for replacement on that truck, to pay for maintenance on that truck. So um, it could be on a per project basis or a, an expenditure type basis. Thank you, that's very helpful. Yep. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, good evening, trustees. It's nice to meet you all. I'm looking forward to working with everyone, uh, particularly during the budget planning process. Um, so for the next few slides, we'll focus on the economic outlook and funding for the 2022 CIP. As we noted in the memo, the finance department presented actual 2020 revenues to council on April 27th. Across all funds, retail sales tax saw an 8% decrease from 2019 to 2020. Use taxes like construction and business consumer did see an increase from 2019 to 2020, moderating some of the negative financial impacts of COVID-19. As outlined in the April business meeting, the open space fund was also supported by one-time revenues that offset the 2020 decline in sales and use tax. Next slide, please. Initially, the Open Space Fund's 2020 revenue budget was set at 31.8 million. The number was revised down to 25.2 million after we experienced the early financial impacts of COVID-19. Our actual 2020 revenues of 30 million are reflected on the right in gray. So overall, the Open Space Fund saw a 5% shortfall from our initial revenue budget in blue to the actual 2020 revenue collected in gray. The reality of these numbers help to inform a realistic target for our 2022 CIP funding. Next slide, please. As Lauren mentioned, the finance department is going to provide us with 2022 revenue estimates in the coming weeks. We developed the draft CIP with a balance of fiscal realities and department priorities in mind. Our priorities included master plan implementation and capital maintenance projects or taking care of what we have. While the projects you see on this list account for long-term revenue impacts of COVID-19, the 0.15% sales tax extension through 2039 will allow us to increase the CIP budget over previous years. As a reminder, the sales tax increments as they exist now are listed at the bottom of this slide. We'll take a look at CIP numbers in the next few slides. Next slide, please. The draft 2022 CIP is funded at 5.37 million, which is consistent with pre-flood CIP averages for the department. You'll notice CIP totals above the department's annual average of four to six million between 2014 and 2018. During that time, the department needed to repair extensive damage on OSMP lands as a result of the 2013 flood. We entered an era of changing revenues in 2019 with the reduction of the 0.11% sales tax 
a reduction of the 0.33% increment down to 0.22, the end of the general fund transfer to OSMP, and the extension of the 0.15% increment through 2039. While the 2022 CIP does account for a multi-year financial recovery from COVID-19, the overall CIP budget is within the normal four to $6 million range for the department. Next slide, please. The 2022 CIP focuses on capital maintenance or taking care of what we have, which has been an explicit effort in the department since 2019. In orange, you'll see that 77% of the 2022 CIP supports capital maintenance. Most of these projects are continuations from previous years. You'll also see that no funding will go toward new facilities or infrastructure in 2022. And with that, I'll turn it back to Lauren to discuss uh, proposed CIP project highlights. Thank you. And some of this will be familiar from the last board retreat um, and some of, some of this will be new. So, so our goal coming out of the master plan with the financial sustainability focus area was to really improve the way that our financial reporting connects to approved plans and to department priorities. So last year as an initial attempt, um, we, we tried to link each CIP project to a primary master plan strategy, and some of that went well and some of that didn't. So our goal was really to expand upon <laughs> one, to find new ways to slice, I think is how I typically say it. Like we want to be able to slice this information in a lot of ways to get you what you need. Um, we knew going into this process, we wanted to emphasize tier one strategies, accelerate those where we could, and we wanted to be able to display our financial information in a way that aligned with the focus areas and the strategies in the master plan. We also wanted to meet the intention of the integrated budget guidance in the master plan, which gives us ranges for our investments in each of the focus areas. It's year two, so I, I don't know that I'd call it trend data just yet, but we wanted to make sure we were keeping that in mind as a gut check. And our, our biggest lesson learned last year was really that our projects address multiple master plan objectives we're not operating in silos, our work is not done in silos, and each project impacts a lot of different strategies. So we made updates in our work planning system to allow each project to connect to a primary, secondary, and tertiary strategy. So we hope that that makes the information more accurate and more reliable um, and, and tells a better story around how the CIP allows us to implement on the master plan objectives. So what we get is this. We have about 72% of the, the CIP dollars invested in tier one projects with 10% in tier two and 18% in tier three. And then if we're looking at a through a focus area lens, we see that EHR is, is getting the, the biggest share of the, the CIP followed by AT&T and our RSE in, in the third place there. As it relates to the integrated budget guidance, we then want to just check and make sure that we're within the ranges that we committed to, to use when the master plan was approved. So um, in EHR, we're, we're middle of range, RSE a little bit low end of range, middle of range on, on agriculture today and tomorrow. Um, and we know we have some work to do over the next few years in bolstering CCEI. Uh, I think my, my overall message there is that in any given year, we're looking at what are the highest priority projects in that year. And so in 2021, 47% was in EHR. We could reasonably expect in some other year that those percentages change um, and we have different investments in different focus areas. And then on financial sustainability, we're somewhere in the middle of range as well. So my last couple of comments here uh, relate to the master plan, but also relate to some of the narrative we've had for the last couple of years around uh, how are we taking care of what we have? How are we investing our dollars? The first thing I want to highlight is around prairie dog management and soil health. So we want to make sure that we're um, being clear on how those commitments are carrying forward, even as we're talking about the CIP in a different way um, in terms of the master plan. So you can see here in 2022, we have three different projects related um, to, to these investments, but I also want to be able to track back the last couple of years. So this first line around soil health and irrigated ag lands and agroecology, you can see that was first year pilot funding that we increased in 2021. 
that work continues, but in 2022, we wanted to be a little bit more specific and more clear about where those dollars are going. And so we've divided that into two projects that you see here in 2022, which is uh, being clear about where we're putting dollars into unleased ag lands and where we're, we're investing in leased properties. So the work continues, we're representing it in a slightly different way. Um, on the prairie dog management front, same thing, 2020, we had early recommendations and some early work getting underway really bolstered funding, almost doubled funding in 2021. And then COVID happened. And so we had a hiring freeze and um, some, some challenges in, in getting work done. And so our goal is to pick all of that back up in 2022, continue to spend those dollars in 21 and 22 and come back with a, a request in say 23 or out years, depending on what's needed once we can hit the ground running this year. So um, final comment is around restore irrigated ag fields with prairie dog conflicts. So we have a, a, a budget right now in 2021 of 370 and you see us increasing to 440 in 2022. So we feel like in the CIP, we've been able to deliver on those key commitments um, and, as well as uh, delivering on the, the master plan and the way we wanna describe that work. Same goes, and this will be my last highlight around, um, you've heard me talking for many years about take care of what we have and baseline assessments and asset management and beehive. So we're not losing that. Um, and in fact, in, we've level funded or increased investment in maintenance CIP categories um, throughout this document. And I'm, I'm sure I missed a few, uh, but here were some examples just out of the packet. So agricultural fencing, We've been able to increase their facility repair and youth cores, which uh, and contracted crews to do our trail projects. We've level funded there. And then for irrigation, farm site improvements and restoration, we've been able to increase in those annual maintenance CIPs. So um, hopefully we're heading in the right direction. We, we hope that we've incorporated all your feedback from retreat in last year around how we want to better display all this information moving forward. Um, and I think with that, we'll turn it over to questions. So. Um, I'll, I'll pose this question, which is what questions do you have? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Sam. It's, really appreciate the presentation. So okay. who, who would uh, like to start out? Um, in this, I'll, I'll just reframe. We, this is not a public hearing. We won't be taking comment. We are uh, providing feedback on a draft plan which will return to us once again in the future as an action item. So really, um, we're just prepared for a discussion essentially of how we feel uh, staff has done, balancing various priorities within the CIP and um, uh, how they've done in terms of linking it with master planning goals. Who has some questions or thoughts to begin with? Michelle. Hi, um, Lauren, Sam, great job. Um, I really appreciate how um, all the numbers here as a numbers person myself um, links up to the master plan um, and uh, the priorities there and it makes it easier to track and particularly the um, associated department assessment plan part of that. Um, I am not going to nitpick projects because I know that that's a very complicated process for you folks to develop your work plan and get things that are shovel ready into the pipeline and ready to do in 2022. My questions um, are, I have one question around, um, you know, taking care of what we have and maintenance, considering, um, you know, because of COVID, we've had a lot of people out on our trails, which is fantastic, but there, you know, the, there's a downside in terms of our lands and needing more maintenance and um, more attention as a result, or our trails as uh, needing more attention as a result. Um, so the 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 percentage of dollars seem a little small to me, and um, relative to other other um, buckets. And I'm wondering if that's because a lot of that work falls into the operating budget. Is that why? Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so. Yes, and I, I'm muted. I can expand upon that. Yes, thank you for for calling that out. And um, so a couple of things in the world of the contracted crews and trail projects, we have 2020, 20, 21, and 22. The plan is any dollars that were unspent last year are being leveraged this year. So we're increasing the amount of contracted crews we're hiring in any given year to try to get a jump start on that deferred maintenance. 
the other piece of that is exactly what you said. Our seasonal and temporary crews carry out a, a large amount of that work. And so when we come forward with the operating budget, we'll talk about that more. But in the trail space, I believe we have seven crew leads and 15 or so crew members that, that'll, that'll do uh, much of that work on the ground. Yeah, as well as our volunteer, uh, linking our volunteer program to the trails work, which is a really robust program in and of itself. I'm not seeing other hands. I do have a quick question. Um, in the land, water, and mineral acquisitions realm, can you just tell us what's roughly slated in and around that? That's sort of a broad category. Yeah, it is broad. And thanks for asking. So uh, 350,000, so you, will, you will be getting presentations over the second and third quarter on some of those proposed projects. The, the biggest one that we're considering right now is a trail easement to implement in the North Foothills area. And so I believe that's actually scheduled for next month to, to start that conversation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there are associated immediate needs dollars and that other immediate needs project related to that potential acquisition. So um, that's the biggest one. And then of course, uh, in any, in any uh, given moment, Bethany and team are, are considering and working with landowners on a number of acquisitions and it's, it'll be uh, whatever, whatever strategic ones are brought to you in the next six months that could close in 2022. Um, on the carryover front, several years ago, we had about a $35 million acquisition carryover. And so we've prioritized spending that down over the last five plus years. And, and in fact, I don't think, yeah, we're not funded at all in the current year. And last year might've been 700,000. So Bethany and Dan and team have done a great job of making once in a lifetime, unbelievable acquisitions. And now we're in a place where we have about 3.5 million in acquisition carryover, which could support maybe one medium sized acquisition or several smaller acquisitions. So what our goal is part of that 350 is to make sure we have what we need for the things that are on our, our plate now without fully depleting what's left of that acquisition carryover. Yeah, the only thing I might add to that is that it's not that CIP fund can be used for associated expenses that may not just go to uh, giving money to the seller for instance, if we needed to do due diligent work, such as survey work, getting appraisals, um, some of the legal fees that are associated with doing due diligence, that also could be pulled from that acquisition fund. So it's purchase price plus everything, sort of those expenses that are associated with doing a correct and uh, transaction. Thank you. And that's with mineral rights, water rights, and land acquisition. Caroline. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. Um, but my question was about water rights. Um, does our, I know our agriculture portion and, and taking care of what we have in the soil restoration falls into that in order to be able to um, start irrigating um, the lands that have water rights that aren't being used right now. But I guess just kind of um, if you could help me to understand that a little better. I was reading some of our um, past packets and, you know, we were discussing that obviously it's a high priority to keep our water rights. And if we were to ever um, unfortunately lose them, it would cost so much to try and regain them that it, it wouldn't even really be cost effective for our budget. Um, and it concerns me with, um, you know, the fire hazard danger and, and things like that, that we're all dealing with right now. So if you could um, talk to me a bit more, if you think you can understand what I'm trying to say about how we are prioritizing that and making sure that we keep all of that. I think m most of this question I'm going to kick to, uh, to Bethany or, or Dan. Um, I think or, as it, or John Potter or John Potter. Yeah. Um, as it relates to, to the projects, I'll my very high level introductory comment. So we know that the acquisition CIP can support acquisition of land, water, or minerals. Um, and so that, that portion is funded out of that, that project. Uh, there's a number of other projects that you mentioned that touch on, on water. So irrigation infrastructure, South Boulder Creek in, in stream flow, 
um, those would be considered much more operational than what you're describing in terms of water rights. Uh, but beyond that, I will kick it to whoever is the best staff person to address that question. Yeah, I think it might be John. It, oh. yeah, John? Sure, Dan. Um, yeah, uh, Caroline, we, we work really hard to use our water rights every year uh, to, to the largest extent that we can. Um, there are ongoing water infrastructure uh, maintenance that we have to do every year. And there's also a certain amount of major maintenance that where things have um, deteriorated. We have not had the capacity to address all the field laterals and all of the ditch infrastructure that, uh, that we would like to do. And that's what the CIP funding generally gets directed to to um, be able to make sure that we do that major maintenance and that we continue to be able to use those water rights and therefore protect them from claims for, from junior rights holders that could um, otherwise interfere with our ability to use them in the future. Sorry, I hit mute and unmute several times. Um, okay, it might... Take me a second if I have a, a second thought on that. Thank you. Karen. Um, two questions. Um, last time we talked about the ag structures spreadsheet, you said it wasn't quite done. Is, is that at a state now that it is complete? Um, I think. Are you referring to our residential um, uh, uses of our residential properties? Are rather, which some of them are definitely in agricultural use. But uh, I think two meetings ago we were talking about that we were doing an assessment of our 38 or Lauren. I don't know what the exact number is, but let's call it 35 residence structures that we own, and that we're doing. Uh, uh, an assessment of what use are they currently in and what is our future desired use of those buildings. And out of that full assessment, are there any of them that we are not foreseeing an open space use for? And I think we, I forgot what month we have that pigeon, but it will be this year in which we come back to the board with uh, a summary of that report and what our findings were. I can just give you a little bit of a sneak preview um, I, for one, um, uh, came into this with a notion that maybe we have some surplus residence lands that maybe aren't serving an open space purpose. And I was um, one of the, I, I guess I'm, I wasn't surprised, but one of the findings that we think we're coming up with is there's probably just a few uh, in which we could probably uh, determine that uh, there may not be a high priority open space use for. Most of them are, are, uh, uh, are turning to uh, have a, a very important either current or potential use for it. A lot of them uh, could be future agricultural tenants. Um, I know that there was a, a lot of studies and a lot of work done at the county level in which one, one of the biggest imp, um, impediments to a successful viable agricultural program, even with all the government support that's involved in Boulder County, is uh, agricultural tenancy uh, is is there's just sure you can make the land available, but they can't afford to be here. Um, you're that's that's a big impediment. So uh, Andy and John and the team um, have taken a close look over the past year on all of our residences to try to link which one of those up would be a priority to link to a uh, an agricultural lease um, area that could then uh, uh, be available for housing, which is really desirable for us because the more people we have on site caring for our lands, the better care of our lands we'll get. So long-winded way of saying that we do have it on the calendar for later this year to uh, bring you the results of that uh, assessment. You're on mute. The reason why I'm asking about that is I'm assuming that is what leads to the item that's labeled historic agricultural facilities rehabilitation to prepare for tenancy. So yeah, and um, maybe the, I, yep, 
Go ahead, Lauren. Um, so that project, I, I believe there are nine sites identified in the ag plan to update their use for tenancy. And so that project is, uh, we, we do three in, in kind of conjunction. So there's the upgrade on, on the house to make it livable um, and usable by the agricultural tenant. And then there's the related farm site improvement project and the irrigation infrastructure project. And so um, we will be focused on the, the Lewis house, which will then go through the farm site improvement and, and irrigation uh, work to, to make, to ready the whole site for agricultural tenancy. So those two that are listed on that page are, are related? Yes. And are these related to the list and the analysis that Dan was just describing, or is it a different component of the open space system? Yeah, so even though we, uh, we pretty much knew that the Lewis House was going to go this route, we have analyzed every single residence that we have even if some of the conclusions were foregone. Like, yeah, it's currently agricultural use and we know it, we know it's gonna con continue to be. We still did a full analysis of each residence, even if we didn't think we had any questions about it. So, so what's budgeted for here is just one of nine other, eight other sites to come. Yes, and building off of the last few years, we did Hunter Kolb and then Park Nagel and now Ertl in the current year and then Lewis. And so we've got that list sort of programmed where over the three year period, we're readying that whole site for, for tenancy. Okay, thank you. And then my other question, I see tall oat grasses on here, but I don't see anything about New Zealand mud snail. Yes, thank is you. That a, is that a funded project or not? It is. So the New Zealand mud snail project was initially on the 2022 CIP list. We knew that staff wanted to begin working on that before the 2022 budget is live. And so when we did our capital carryover project, we had about $400,000 remaining for COVID response and recovery, compared that against the, the actions for COVID that need to take place this year. And we actually removed $75,000 from that carryover so that we could dedicate it to New Zealand mud snail work in the current year. So. There was there was an urgency and an eagerness to to get the ball rolling now, so we we opted to do that instead of waiting until 2022. So it'll be fully funded and implemented in 2021. Well, we have I should say we have seventy five thousand dollars earmarked for that work, and and I would defer to John around um, scope of what will get accomplished in the current year. I will be coming to the board in June with uh, a lot of information about that project, Karen, and uh, we can explain the, the budget breakout uh, for between this year and 2022 when we give you that presentation. So there probably will be something added in on here about New Zealand mud snail, or is it here already? And I'm just overlooking it. it it'll, the $75,000 that Lauren was talking about will carry us uh, from 21 into 22. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Caroline, please. Yeah. Caroline. Um, so, kind of going back to ag real quick, we had. 500 acres and 10 properties that were leased in 2020, if I wrote that down correctly. And then um, I read in previous packet that our um, lease opening and agreements were going to be January and February. So I didn't know um, if anyone had kind of an update on that or like an overview. Do we think that those numbers would be the same this year? A lot less, a lot more. Um, as far as opening up new leases or how many acres of land will be under new leases? I'm gonna keep you on the mic, John. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, I can address that one, Caroline. Uh, we, it was uh, considerably fewer acres this year, uh, two, two, pro two properties this year totaling about, um, about 50 or 60 acres. Um, really, it's kind of, it depends a lot on what, what tenants are doing, are, are some retiring, are some properties being brought back online that were unleasable, for example, because of prairie dogs. 
Um, th those are the sorts of considerations that the ag staff uh, go through every year. We just didn't happen to have very many properties available this year. We, we should have about the same or, or more um, later this winter, so. But John, um, do you have a uh, offhand, like how many uh, uh, tenants we currently have and how much acreage on the, on the, oh. on the system for Michelle's benefit and others? Well, sure, yeah. Um, so we, we lease out about 15,000 acres to, uh, I think it's 38 tenants currently. Um, and, uh, and those, those tenancies range in size from a few acres to, uh, uh, eight to 10,000 for our largest one, I think is, is somewhere between eight and 10,000 acres. And that's uh, really a difference between these, uh, sort of local food sites that we've been developing where it's more, uh, more crop oriented versus the rangeland, which, uh, is leased out in a lot larger quantity, but uh, far lower productivity per acre. And and what um, Caroline was asking about was the the frequency the frequency at which these parcels turn over or become available for a proposal. Uh, we go out and seek proposals from the ag community for leasing the properties. And are there properties that are on the cusp of being able to be leased. I know some of our properties um, with prairie dog issues and stuff probably are, are not close to being leasable, but do you have numbers of one, two, three years that, that would be, you know, a significant amount of acreage that could be leased? Yeah, um, be, we, don't, we don't have a projection yet for 2022, uh, but we will be developing that in the fall as uh, we start to hear from tenants whether they will Re renew their lease or not. Um, we do have several, we, we have a couple of properties where we're trying to work out access. Um, and if we can improve access, we will be able to lease them then. Uh, also some of this soil health work that we've been doing uh, should should hopefully make some some additional properties available if not in for 2022 then for 2023. Um, on the topic of uh, soil health, um, First off, I really recognize how difficult it is to allocate individual projects out to master plan tiers um, and getting that all to work right. The one thing I notice is um, we are really amplifying our investment in soil health, which um, through my experience with this board um, is sort of an innovative realm, frankly. We often arrive at questions that are unanswered, et cetera. And just in terms of our um, commitments to do what we can in terms of the climate crisis, I just think it's really important that we take really good notes about the investments we're making, that we publicize that re research, and we help other groups doing similar work around the country, around the world, um, come to less unknown uh, questions than we have as we've kind of gotten started out. So I just encourage people, um, as far as making good on that, I see, outbound education is a big part of what we have to do in soil health. Dave? So I have a question and I may be overlooking it in the uh, tables, but are, are we still uh, focused on evaluating uh, a, a new headquarters or are, are are we, what are we doing as far as evaluating, um, you know, future needs and are we setting money aside to uh, fund that in the future? Yeah, thank you. And, and I can start and maybe Dan jump in. So um, in the fund financial that we'll bring forward over the next couple of months, um, like what we did last year, we've held some out year dollars in reserves um, right now, it's subject to change, but right now it's about a million dollars in reserves um, to just signal that there may be a need to save for some future action. So we know that our, our lead, we, we're in a five year lease. Uh, what it's looking more like is that we would, we would support some sort of extension on that lease. Um, and, and we want to make sure that we're working in, in cooperation with the rest of the city. So um, those dollars, I think, would would just make sure that we have um, 
funds available as we do that exploration. But I think at present, we were certainly not thinking like we were a couple of years ago around broad redevelopment of Cherryvale or anything like that. Um, we're, we're looking at what might it look like to stay in, in the hub for a couple of more years. So are we in our fourth year of the five-year lease? I believe the lease is through 23. I'm just confirming that. Okay. And Lauren, when I was um, yes. looking from the April packet, the proposed budget, I, might, I hope I'm saying this right, the OSMP long-term office space, it seems like in the budget report updated, um, if you look at for um, the city of Boulder, that it changed. The city of Boulder seemed to take out um, 2022 and 2023 at $500,000, which were in hours from last year. Do you know what I'm talking about? Not, on, not specifically on the budget book, but you're, you're correct that that's budgeted out of the operating budget. So it, within the central services operating budget, we have that half million dollar line item to, to pay for the annual lease. Um, we have that through 2023 and we'll, we'll begin talking about what an extension would look like as that fits. I'd have to look back at the budget book to see how they've represented it. The city has a, a lot of work going on, particularly around hybrid work coming out of COVID and pilot workspaces and a lot yeah. of construction. We've given up leases through COVID. So a lot of very complex movement there, but our piece of that has not changed. And I can refer back to the budget book and make sure it's captured appropriately. Yeah, I, I heard city council talking last night um, about the hybrid workspace and all the different things that they were doing with that. So I assumed um, that would be why. But yeah, what was in our April packet under the long term office space, um, the, the 500,000 for 2022 and 2023 are not um, in the approved budget. Okay, I'll take a look at that. That that is our intention when we come forward with our operating budget that will that will stay as part of the, the central services budget. Karen. You're muted. Karen, you're muted over there. Can one of you give me a sense of the scale of the $167,000 in system-wide sign and communication enhancement? I assume that this is not COVID-related kind of signage. <laughs> and <laughs> I hope we're moving forward. They did, a, <laughs> staff did a wonderful job, but no. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, how much is $167,000 in signage? You must uh, right off the top of your head say, well, COVID signs cost this many thousands. <laughs> so give me an example of what's that, what that scale is. Sure. And I would say there's, there's sort of three discrete parts of that project to my, to my memory. So one is a continuation of what we did last year around interpretive signage. So interpretive educational signage in facilities. So we have about $30,000 there, which would cover Flagstaff um, and South Mesa, I believe are the priority areas for interpretive signage next year. Uh, we also have a continuation of the mobile hotspots that we talked about um, for around $30,000. So, so we're updating those, um, so it, it provides Wi-Fi at trailheads to pay for parking, as well as um, connectivity to access interactive trail maps and communications. Uh, so that those are about 2,500 each. We have 14 fee trailheads and we're trying to get to as many as we can. Um, and then the rest is we have signs that are, are breaking down that need to be replaced and upgraded. Um, and in talking with Bill, our, our sign supervisor, we're hoping to hit the four uh, biggest, highest visitation areas next year. So I think Chautauqua, Sanitas, Wonderland, and South Mesa were, were his goals. Um, so I guess I think of it more regionally, like a hundred or so of that would cover those four highest, highest visited areas. Thanks. Do people have more questions um, or are we, are we getting to a place where we feel comfortable with the overall balance here? Um, just as a reminder, again, we'll see this back in our next meeting as an action item. We have another month to sort of uh, chew on this and perhaps provide some additional feedback by email. I'm just hoping to tease out any, uh, anybody feeling like they're, they, they haven't captured uh, the right balance, et cetera. 
Um, how are people feeling? Caroline? Um, I just have one more question related to trails and then I can answer that question. So um, I keep looking around, I don't have it in front of me, but out of all of the goals that we have in all of their different categories, there's like 47, 49. And I read that the only goal um, under EHR was number three, which happened to be related to Beehive, which happened to be related to the 20% um, for that new trails coordinator position. Um, and I've heard other boards say, um, I don't know why, but that Beehive has kind of been, I don't know if it's with COVID that it was a problem or um, what, but, but it did say that we uh, met that goal, that out of our um, open space acres, that 20% was um, like grafted into Beehive. But I'm, I'm wondering if that is accurate. Um, make sure I understand. So around how the department is doing in, in adopting and configuring Beehive and then how that impacts the, the carry out of those strategies? Well, I guess the first question would be, it was written that it was met, that 20% was, um, you know, walked and then documented and able oh, to I see. Beehive. Is that accurate? Yeah, my understanding is that that's all on track. So the position that we converted from temp to standard, the trails research coordinator does 20% of the designated and undesignated trails on the system per year um, and has a really good system down to do that. So that the Jake is out there with the HUTAP cart doing that collection. It's it's syncing well with all of our systems. And, and I think we've been really happy about how that's going. We have dollars in the current year to configure new data sets and, and integrate those into Beehive outside of trails and undesignated trails. But the current data sets, I think we're, we're happy. It, it, was our, it was our first big experiment. So I think as we onboard other data sets, we're gonna be looking back at and, and saying, do we need to, to make any adjustments to how we did trails? But so far so good, I think we're, we're quite happy with um, what got accomplished in that space. Okay, so maybe it wasn't that it was um, saying I did read and, and sorry, I don't have it in front of me to reference it, but again, out of like the, the 47, the only one that we didn't um, complete was EHR two. And I believe that that fell under that, which is why I was confused, but I've, I've seen Jake out there with the cart. <laughs> so I know he's out there doing it. He um, is out there. Because I felt like it was saying two different things. Yeah. So this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Caroline. So there's a section in the, in the packet that has the tier one strategies and what we've invested and I have a comment there that says the only tier one strategy that doesn't have money in the 22 CIP is around updating, continuing to implement those system plans guiding ecosystem management. Yeah. Um, and, and I had that debate as I wrote that because that doesn't mean work's not getting done. It means that the project manager didn't think it was a top three purpose of their project. Um, so I think from, from our perspective, it's not that we're uh, delinquent in any of those commitments, like there's work being planned and scheduled and we think we're making progress. It was not considered a primary driver of the project that's in the 2022 CIP, if that makes sense. As long as the commitment for the 20% for the next five years is still the plan. For the monitoring, yes, 20% a year. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, I'd like to just return back to the high level. Do people um, feel pretty pretty good about where we leave this this draft review? Michelle, I see a nod. Dave's nodding. Great. I'm I'm hesitant um, in how I want to word this um, because I do think that it's difficult, and there are other departments that do climate. Um, initiatives. But I feel like in our reserves um, and what we have budgeted out for actual um, climate initiatives, it, it seems like what we've talked about is stuff on the back end, like um, we've categorized it as doing firework when the fire has already happened. Um, and it does concern me moving forward that these larger, bigger events are going to continue to happen and that what we put in the CIP, I think really should show that we're trying to protect those you know, capital assets um, and things and, and not doing it on the back end, but doing it on the front end. So I wish that there was more uh, in 
the packet, um, but I'm still looking it over again. It's, it is it is difficult for me because we just get it a week ahead of time. So I can follow up with um, some more definitive thoughts as I've had more time to, to look at the packet um, and what I think, but I think it would, it's important to say that moving forward, you know, if we have another big fire this year, et cetera, et cetera, that we really are, um, and I know that you are very conservative, Lauren, um, with money, which I've, you know we all appreciate, um, but that we're really thinking about that, and that you know it's this is the new norm, and and making sure that we're really um, accepting that reality. A couple of comments there, Caroline. Um, starting, not starting. We've done we've we've been doing some great work on the climate crisis, but what we're starting to do now is put all of those actions. Uh, sort of uh, pull them together so we have a really good inventory of all the actions that we're doing that's related to addressing the climate crisis, including the fact that this year we've uh, we've actually significantly increased our capacity in our fire uh, our forest health and fire mitigation program. Um, we've um, increased staffing um, and 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 done some other things uh, directly with that program specifically. Um, but um, we could work on um, um, maybe having uh, John uh, provide you at the next at the next meeting, Lauren. Uh, we can steal a little bit of your time, and maybe you could spend five minutes, sort of just talking about how we're pulling together all this, all the climate information. Because uh, I think you'd be impressed, Caroline. I think we're really starting to get a really good handle of everything we're doing, and it's going to allow us to. Uh, pinpoint more accurately where we want to enhance some efforts. Well, and, and I know we had to reduce stuff. Like I know they took out 700,000 from the general fund for um, fire, you know, just related to COVID and, and needing to cut back. Um, and I was excited to hear, and, and I know that Sam Weaver was at the meeting that transportation, they're implementing this new law, um, which could be up to like $700 million for our city's vehicles in order to help make them green. Um, and of course, for our department, if we were privy to that expense, I mean, that would lower our CO2 so significantly. So um, they, they were actually up late last night working on the bill. So I haven't um, seen any updates. So um, I don't want to make it seem like I'm kind of throwing it on you guys and saying like, <laughs> you know, like fix this problem. And I know that there are other departments out there that are um, kind of created for this, but um, I would just like for all of us to like think about it and make sure that we're really making it front and center. And again, hopefully if that bill goes forward, then that would go towards our fleet, which would be, you know, a great thing. And I saw that we budgeted, which I didn't even understand. It was like 25,000 for one green vehicle, but an electric vehicle would cost more than $25,000. So. Yeah, we have, um, uh, so the way that we save, we have a, a process called FRNR. So where we're, we're saving um, in partnership with FAM for replacement of our vehicles. So what you're seeing in the CIP is augmented funding to upgrade to something that would be more energy efficient. So what we're saving for is a typical replacement funding. Um, and, and then what we're adding through our CIP is opportunities to green the fleet or green our equipment. Um, which costs more than than that operating component of the money, which is if we were to just go out and buy the same truck, here's what it would cost. Well, here's the incremental cost of making it greener. So, um, so that's kind of it, it. That is a confusing narrative. Uh, we're going to talk about fleet and uh, fleet repair and replacement in the operating budget, but that's that's the intent of that CIP line. Okay. And if I um, if we hang up tonight and I hear anything else about, it's called three green enterprises is that um, Colorado has been working on, so hopefully that, that bill gets a yes. And if I see anything, I'll forward it to you guys. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, Lauren, thank you very much, of course. Will we um, have you at the action item at uh, next month's meeting? Sure will. Wonderful. And Sam, thank you so much. We look forward to working with you more closely and really appreciate you joining us here. Thank you. Looking forward to working with you all as well. Great. So Dan, I believe you have some verbal updates. Um, yeah, for... I do have a few minutes worth of updates. I put some notes together uh, to remind me of things that I want to pass along to you. Um, 
uh, I'll also, in addition, at the end of the month, put out the email update with some other items as well. But I just wanted to first update you, give you a, a, a quick update on the Settlers Park renaming um, update. Um, I believe it was Hal and Karen that might have been sitting in at the tribal consultation uh, when that item was addressed. I think Dave, you were in after that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but um, so in the 2016 Indigenous Peoples Day resolution that was adopted by council, um, there was a specific sort of uh, ask, if you were a request, uh, to look at um, uh, the Settlers Park name and to uh, uh, work with the community and especially the tribes that we have uh, agreements with on uh, uh, doing a name change for Settlers Park. Um, and so it's actually been about a four year effort uh, starting with the Indigenous Peoples Day uh, resolution. And at that time, we also collected feedback and some suggested names from community members. We then turned our attention to working with over a dozen tribal nations. And over a course of two consultations in 2019 and 2021, as well as a working group that we formed with tribal representatives throughout 2020, uh, we were uh, undertaking that step to get to see if we could get some consensus among the tribal reps on a name that they could recommend for us. And so um, that came to a successful conclusion in April of this year in which there was unanimous consent amongst uh, the over dozen tribes there uh, of the name, the People's Crossing. And I just wanted to quickly pass that name by, but I also just wanna let you know that a full name change application is currently in its final stage of being drafted, which has a lot of great narrative of why the tribes came up with that name, the history of why we're actually doing a name change out at set the Settlers Park area. And, um, and that is being put together. Phil Yates is putting the final touches on that. That's gonna actually be part of the council, mem uh, council packet, the June 1st council packet. And once we have that completed, we will provide a link to you so you can read a lot of the great information uh, about this effort. Um, but we are following the city's name change application process. And so what the next steps are is the city manager okays, gives the okay to uh, the name. Um, and then that uh, will be uh, a call up consideration item at the council meeting on June 1st. Whether they call it up or not is, is still a question. I would imagine that they're gonna be pretty excited to at least hear a couple of words about um, where we're at with the process. But uh, once uh, we hear back from council, uh, then we could uh, commit to actually doing the infrastructure that would be needed. Uh, our commitment would be is that we would at least have the main uh, nameplate out there uh, changed over with uh, probably some temporary signs of, of why the name was changed and, and, and how it came about. Uh, and then we're also forming a working group with tribal representatives to continue to look at interpretive and educational materials out at the site to better reflect the history um, out there. And, um, and so we anticipate over the coming years to, to do further work than just changing the name of the site uh, and to do some more interpretive and educational signage out there. But we wanna do that in partnership with the tribes. And so a working group will be formed uh, to help us do that work. So look for more information from us uh, as part of the June 1st council packet. Um, and then uh, we'll continue to keep you updated throughout the summer. Our hopes is that we can have some sort of commemoration or ceremony associated with Indigenous Peoples Day weekend, which is in early October. And of course, the board will be invited and uh, to participate. And, um, but in the meantime, we'll just kind of keep you up to date as milestones in this effort uh, get reached in and uh, where, where we go from there. Um, just uh, a second uh, update. I just want to update you on a couple of trail, uh, trail closures that I want to uh, voice to you, but also any community members that are, are listening. Uh, many of you know that we have a significant trail project going on up in Anemone Hill. And as part of that work, um, there's going to be some uh, helicopter um, um, activity going on on Monday, May 24th, depending on the weather. And uh, that is to mobilize materials to the project site. 
And we will be doing some community outreach on the fact that you may see helicopters in the area and what it's all about. Um, and so I just wanted to alert you to that. Uh, there will also um, um, be uh, some Bear Canyon Trail reroute and closure uh, work coming up. So our trail contractor out there will start construction on about a two thirds of a mile reroute of Bear Canyon Trail. Um, and due to uh, the fact that there's some rockfall hazard potential from the project site, a closure of the Bear Canyon Trail will uh, be in place from 6, 8, 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And this is actually ex uh, expected to start the week of May 24th and go through uh, November of this year. Uh, but the trail will be open on weekends and in, uh, in the evenings. And uh, additionally, uh, speaking of helicopter, we will need to mobilize equipment to the project site. So there'll be a brief, we're thinking of a one hour closure associated with an airlift of some materials, uh, on, again, on May 24th, weather dependent. So just wanted to alert you all to that and uh, uh, of that upcoming work. Um, next, I just wanna provide you with some, a few updates on our interagency discussions and efforts that are ongoing with Colorado Canyon State Park and the Highway uh, 170 uh, corridor from 93 to the state park. Um, and it, it's obviously a subject of matters from the board, but uh, as you know, CPW has released its draft Eldorado Canyon State Park Management Plan. Um, again, you have this uh, next on your agenda, but I just wanna reiterate that staff is currently reviewing the draft plan and that we intend to provide CPW with comments uh, by the end of the month. Um, but some high level themes that are emerging from our initial review is that overall, uh, the staff is not seeing any major concerns and believe that the plan does allow for management consistency and ongoing collaboration. And we are not anticipating adverse effects to OSMP lands and management uh, coming out of this plan. We have identified a few minor clarifications and uh, uh, corrections that we will uh, provide CPW in that. And that um, we will be requesting some refinement in some of the language around it, uh, the existing leases and future interagency coordination that is mentioned. But in regards to leases, I just wanna make it clear that staff may consider uh, renewing existing leases and consider others like around Fowler Trail. Uh, but if leasing seems like an appropriate management action in the future, we will certainly need to bring and want to bring that request to the board if, if it so happens that that, that, uh, that is an action uh, that we would that we would consider doing at a later date. So, um, but we do have some uh, language clarification that we'll do in that area of the plan as well. So just a little sneak peek, pre, uh, peek at some of the uh, themes and issues that we expect to make comments on uh, in our staff review. Um, on another Eldo State Park related matter, uh, Boulder County Transportation is once again anticipating operating a shuttle from Highway 93 to the State Park and uh, from Memorial Day weekend through uh, Labor Day. And the times would be 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays, including holidays. But like last year, OSMP is not going to participate in the service. And this means that our trailheads and our access points along high, uh, 170 will not be points of pickup or drop off for the shuttle. So I just wanted to uh, make you aware of that. And also staff from a few agencies uh, are meeting this month to discuss and identify other strategies and actions to consider along the 170 corridor during the summer months, uh, especially on weekends to try to address vehicle congestion, neighborhood impacts and safety concerns. And that can include signage and other ways to inform visitors who wish to enter the state park, especially when we know the state park is at its capacity. So as more strategies and details emerge from these interagency discussions, uh, I will uh, provide an update and it may even be at, uh, if things emerge in the next few weeks, uh, part of the monthly update that I'll give you at the end of the month. And finally, uh, we know that uh, with good weather becomes people wanting to get outside. And so Phil Yates has led a collaborative effort with eight land management agencies along the front range to develop a press release that will go out next Tuesday. And really the theme of the press release is to recreate responsibly this summer and be courteous on area trails and minimize disturbance to sensitive natural areas. And so we have uh, 
uh, enlisted eight other eight uh, front range agencies that want to be part of this. So we expect to do a, a pretty good media blitz uh, um, uh, in that uh, next week. So be on the lookout for that. So those are some of my quick updates. And again, uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll put together an uh, email with some other items for you as well. Thank you so much, Dan. And um, yes, recreate responsibly. I'm, I'm delighted to hear uh, we're out front weaving uh, people together and, and voicing that message. It's greatly appreciated. Um, that takes us to the matters from the board segment of our meeting. Um, and uh, we have three different items to move through. Um, we made a last minute adjustment to the agenda that is going to bring a uh, brief discussion of the Greenways uh, representative um, to the Board of Trustees. And Dave, you are set to discuss that for us, are you not? I am. Great. Am I? Am I yes, I am. Uh, so, um, board representation to the Greenways Advisory Committee um, has been a request that the utilities department has made over the years. Uh, there are several boards that provide representatives to the Greenways Advisory Committee. So it's the Open Space Board, uh, the Parks Board, and Transportation uh, that, that um, it, oh, and water. Uh, the, God, I can't remember the name of the board, but what the water board uh, does that as well. So traditionally, uh, the open space board has nominated uh, a member of, of the board to serve as a representative. And primarily what happens is that there's one annual meeting and primarily it's a review of the Greenways CIP uh, for the upcoming year. Now, uh, this year and in the next couple of years, there is the Greenways Master Plan Revision, which is another uh, major work item uh, that the Greenways Advisory Committee will participate in as well. So um, the, the annual CIP review, uh, there is some open space connection to that because open space uh, lands and trails um, go along or through greenways. And so there is uh, some implication as far as the management um, uh, projects that the greenways uh, group is proposing as they relate to open space. Greenway staff and open space staff uh, coordinate. So by the time the information gets to the greenways advisory committee, uh, the staff has uh, basically worked through the details and um, is in agreement, uh, staffs are in agreement on uh, what the projects are that are on that uh, CIP list. So uh, I have served the last couple of years as the board representative. Um, and traditionally it's uh, one of the newer members of the board that gets that uh, distinct honor of uh, serving on the Greenways Advisory Committee. And so I will nominate uh, Caroline to do that. And the, one of the reasons, and Michelle, you may actually know about uh, the Greenways Advisory Committee. Um, I had but, served on it at, when I was on PRAB, I had actually served on it. Oh, okay. Well, then, then you do. I've done my time. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, you probably have that feeling. So anyway, I, I am nominating uh, Caroline to be the board representative for the coming year uh, on the Greenways Advisory Committee. And I would be absolutely delighted. And thank you for the nomination, <laughs> You're as long as it is the will of the board. Wonderful. Yes, let's take a, a, a brief run through the role. Um, Karen, do you support Caroline in our Greenways representative role? Yes. Wonderful. Dave, you certainly do. I do. Um, I do. Uh, Michelle? Absolutely, not it. <laughs> <laughs> um, wonderful. Don't, well, uh, don't take that seriously, Caroline. No, it's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> yes, don't have as much time. Important investments being made on that. Yeah. So 
Thank you very much um, for representing all of us. We, we're sure you'll do a wonderful job. And I'll be happy if you would like to talk further, I'll be happy to talk with you as we kind of transition um, yeah, over this year. Great. So. Great. Um, that takes us uh, to our uh, second item under matters from the board. And this is sort of a large important one. I'll start by framing it up. Um, as written on the agenda, this is the draft resolution regarding South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. Um, this document, which you will find uh, in the packet, and I'm speaking largely to observers now, of course, uh, my co-trustees are, are aware of it, um, is essentially a compendium of a series of motions made uh, primarily over the last three years related to the CU South uh, flood mitigation project, the environmental uh, mitigation and remediation elements, and um, recently, more recently, annexation related business, which impacts that environmental uh, mitigation. And the reason that the document has been uh, assembled, um, it was really the product of our previous study section on um, you know, the CU South uh, project, where we explored the documentation that had been raised during previous dispositions especially the granite disposition, um, where we uh, looked in detail at what prior boards, um, Open Space Board of Trustees, had done in situations like this, took those as a model, and began to formulate our thoughts um, more coherently in a single, easy um, to read and in concise place. Um, I think uh, as far as our goals this evening, um, for myself, what I think would be very valuable is to uh, first down, uh, run, run through each board member's opinion of how well we have done um, the, the goal of that project, which is to encapsulate those prior motions, um, to discuss uh, what next steps, if any, may be there for us, and um, to gauge everybody's feeling about the timeline associated with making some of these um, important communications. I will uh, frame this up that it is, seems generally um, agreed that especially the parts in this document that are rele uh, relevant to annexation are important for uh, the City of Boulder's uh, negotiation team to be aware of um, as they enter these discussions and largely it's an act uh, to prevent miscommunication or misunderstanding um, regarding these uh, wetland acres which have threatened species and uniquely high habitat value um, and are quite valuable to the open space system and how we're thinking about uh, balancing human life safety against the needs to uh, honor those species and uh, meet our charter goals as trustees. So with that overview, um, well, okay, um, Michelle, you have something to start us off with. That's great. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, before we dig into the substance of the, of the, of this uh, document and the other matters of the board. And I'd like to address just the general process and procedure um, with the development of these documents. Uh, and uh, so I understand how we got to both of these documents that were drafted by the board, uh, by members of the board to be signed by OSBT, including a, this draft resolution that you mentioned, Hal, um, that is written in a pretty legal way. Um, and as you guys know, I served on, I served five years on the Parks and Rec Advisory Board and, uh, and you know, inserting resolutions into the packet or, or letters that are, are, are to be signed by the board. They're not things that I've seen done before um, without, um, without being discussed in a public board meeting. And I know that I've only been part of one meeting and I would have uh, anticipated that this would have been brought up last month. And while I appreciate that there are times the board needs to draft things and it's extremely painful to try to do, do a group live edit, 
Um, I was caught off guard by the introduction of these documents with, you know, again, without a discussion in, in our, our last public meeting. Um, you know, I've seen drafting of letters, you know, requested by the board, you know, at a public board meeting and um, a, you know, a call or request for volunteers to help draft that. And, and typically that's been, um, you know, it's the, 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 we would try to appoint, you know, two people with a, a diversity of opinions, um, you know, to take an initial stab at it. You know, again, that, that's done at a public board meeting. Um, and then it's brought back to the board uh, meeting for public discussion. You know, the way these two documents came about, um, you know, not knowing, um, not being aware of them or discussing the, the drafting of them publicly in advance is just a little concerning for me, you know, as a new board member. Um, I'd really like to understand how these happen, these things happen. Yeah. So I would like to, to ask, you know, who, who had a hand in drafting them and who had a hand in editing them? Um, you know, and I, I would just like to, uh, you know, make a request that I'd, I'd like to see this, uh, I'd like to know about this stuff in advance. Yeah, I'd, um, I'll op by, open up by um, shedding a little light on that. I'll start by repeating that this document was commissioned during a public meeting a public study session on the topic of CU South. And so um, there's a lot of opportunity for you to go to review that meeting and you'll learn quite a bit more about the nexus of our next steps as discussed um, as a board there. Uh, regarding the specific drafting of this document, uh, Karen has worked on it and I, as in my role as chairperson, have also reviewed it. Um, I agree with you that this is something that at this stage, does now probably need committee work. That would be my personal opinion. And we can, we can go through that uh, piece of it here shortly. Um, it is uh, the prerogative of this board to allow the creative work of trustees to be floated up under matters from the board. Um, and that is an opportunity which is equally open to all trustees and one which I encourage people to take advantage of. Um, it, it, your, your core point of uh, it is difficult to uh, take the time of the public and particularly costly to take the time of the staff to do work at this level of detail. I think it's really important that it starts with an individual trustee who takes projects upon themselves, which they care about to bubble up to the surface. Um, so I hope that sort of encapsulates uh, during the study session, we made clear that we were a going to have at our next board meet, meeting, a discussion of annexation related items which had nexus and interest in terms of environmental mitigation, which we then carried out in the public setting. And um, at that particular meeting, we also engaged in the discussion of Karen undertaking a review of the granite disposal, seeing that as a template and bubbling that forward. So um, that's, that's the specific nexus on the uh, draft resolution for the South Boulder Creek flood, flood mitigation. You also mentioned the uh, letter on El Dorado draft bump. And to be honest, uh, the nexus of that document came about in the fact that there was not going to be any other opportunity other than this public meeting to discuss that because the due date for comments on the bump is prior to our next board meeting. Um, that was uh, done in consultation with Dan, where we made clear that there was a desire of the board to take up this issue, look at it. And due to the timing of the meeting, the fact that staff needs to submit comments uh, prior to our next board meeting, this is uh, the way that we decided to deal with it, which is we bubble it up through matters from the board. And here we are in our public meeting prepared to discuss it. Hopefully that's helpful. I, I, I'll go ahead and say, um, I, I would encourage you to be prepared for more of it. Um, this, this, this board does a lot of business, a lot of important items, and it takes creative and productive work by trustees. I encourage you to volunteer for these committees, help create these documents and to participate in that process. And I absolutely look forward to doing that. I just want to make sure that this is something that doesn't doesn't come as a surprise and 
um, to me uh, and that all of a sudden there is a very legal looking document that's put in here. And I understand that you're, the way that you summarize that how is that it's a compilation and aggregation of previous motions. I, I disagree with that slightly because it's not a verbatim um, uh, aggregation of previous motions. And in fact, I, I find many of the points to be significantly different. Let's, and so to have that, again, that's a substance issue. And I, I, I really just wanted to address the process and to say that I should be prepared to be surprised often by um, documents that are going to be signed or, res, you know, very legal documents um, that have resolutions, very legal looking documents um, that have resolutions baked into them. And again, to be signed by presumably a, a board that I'm a member of is, uh, you know, a little unsettling to me. I, 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 I look forward to participating in this and, and being involved. I, I understand and relate to it, but I just do want to be clear as the current board chair that the 10 days of notice, which comes with the board packet prior to this meeting, which is sufficient for all matters from the department, will also be sufficient for all matters from the board. Karen, you had some comments? Yeah, I just wanted to add one other thing from the study session in February before you were on the board, Michelle, obviously. Um, we went over an initial draft of ideas to be in a, a resolution with the full intent that, there, that the board was discussing these items as a, a initial bulleted list of, of items that would be in a draft resolution. So that level of discussion happened before you ever arrived on the board and, and was in a fully public meeting on February 24th. Dave. Yeah, Michelle, I think your concerns are well-founded and certainly uh, I think we understand um, I will say on the two that we're considering tonight, there, there have been extensive background uh, processes that have led to them. Um, three years for the El Dorado Canyon State Park uh, plan and uh, probably almost 10 years for uh, the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. So th there's been an extensive background that has culminated in these particular drafts. The other thing is more procedural and, and that is, is what Hal has referred to. I think this board has learned, um, you know, by, by uh, what mis mistake and hard knocks that um, oftentimes uh, if, there are, if there is no motion language created so that you know it speaks to whatever the issues are trying to craft that during a public meeting is extremely difficult and time consuming so in the interest of trying to keep the conversation focused efficient and effective governance um, I think as Hal mentioned board members take it upon themselves to offer up drafts for consideration and to focus the conversation. That doesn't mean that there's a knee-jerk approval of whatever the draft is. It's simply that this is what, you know, some board member thought might move the conversation to wherever it needs to go. And so I guess, uh, as Hal mentioned, um, this board has found that to be, you know, particularly effective. And there have been some um, good recent examples. Uh, our, the prairie dog management issue is certainly one that um, has taken a lot of this board's time and I think the board benefited from uh, you know all board members actually offering um, their uh, contributions as far as how to deal with um, certain elements of the issue and uh, what motion language was most effective. Similarly um, on the Aldo uh, visitor use master plan, uh, there have been previous motions that the board has made that, again, underlie um, kind of where we're at at this point. But the key thing now is that the annexation uh, at CU South, that 
uh, process is going to be complete shortly and, and uh, possibly before our next meeting in June. And similarly, as, as Hal mentioned, the, uh, the El Dorado Canyon State Park uh, Visitor Use Master Plan comment deadline is, is May 25th. So it was like, well, if this board is gonna take any kind of, make any kind of consideration or take any kind of action, this is the meeting that it has to happen at. And um, some of us said, okay, well, we'll draft some things up so that uh, we can have those on the table for consideration. So don't get me wrong. I, I am a huge proponent of efficiency and, and trying to get our, our meeting shorter rather than longer. <laughs> so I, I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, but because in April, I, we, you know, I, I didn't uh, um, vote on the minutes because I knew we had um, a, a revised the motions from March. I kind of thought those things were done. So th this is why it was a surprise to me because I thought, oh, well, we just had a fresh batch of motions. And then when I, and including the one just uh, of the uh, light and noise one, and then, um, so I, I read those, I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to um, vote on the amendment of those motions or the minutes because I wasn't here. So I had a fresh look at those motions and then to see it reemerge this month in you know, the same sort of items, but in, in my opinion, written in a different way and written in a, a heavier hand. That was where I, 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 didn't, I, I felt surprised and I also felt surprised that the language was different when I did know that this was coming um, a week ago or wherever that um, Hal had called me, um, that I, I was expecting something that was gonna be a verbatim compilation of past motions. And that's not what I interpret happened here. Yeah, the resolution language, actually, Michelle, I think, um, you know, kind of springboarded off the past motion foundation. And, you know, the motions were basically, here's what the board thinks. The solution in my mind is, here's what the, not only here's what the board thinks, but here's how it th thinks should be done or and so it's 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 using the language and you know the recommendations and direction from past motions to say okay, here's here's how we think that you know we we should accomplish whatever you know it is that we've identified, and so it's a little different than just kind of recapturing the language of the motions. It does go a step further, and again, it it was offered in the spirit of. Um, you know, if, if we're moving to these decision points, let's make sure we know specifically kind of what needs to happen as part of, you know, the overall decisions. And, and I'll just uh, say for my part, I think that this is a good time um, because we scheduled this for our meeting um, to productively take up some detailed discussion um, and make some headway on this, uh, discussing any parts of it that are giving anyone indigestion um, and talking about what next steps may be on it. Um, Caroline. Yeah, thank you. I, I think also, um, and, and Michelle, I know that you've served on board, so you might know this, but just our charter language for what a disposal is, is probably what led to this document having um, such specific wording. Um, so that was just all I wanted to say on that. And then before we dive in, Hal, I didn't know if you wanted a five minute break or you just want to keep going or <laughs> whatever you think. <laughs> I'll defer to board members. Would people like a five minute break before we get a little technical or are people seeking to push? I think a break would be nice. Okay, great. I'll tell you, if Caroline and Dave, we've got two, I'll join them and say, why don't we take a, a five minute break, which brings us back, um, at 9.43, is that right? Great, thank you everyone.
Karen, it's so warm today. How is it you're wearing a scarf? <laughs> and Caroline's wearing a turtleneck. Caroline's wearing uh, a I'm, I'm pretty cold blooded. <laughs> <laughs> So nice for the sun to come out. Yeah, it was. It. I can't tell you how glad I was to see it. What is that thing in the sky? <laughs> so bright. Really, see, I felt like yesterday was so good. I went for a drive up in the canyon to look at some of the project sites, and you know, snowing up there, and it, oh, it's so nice. I like the cold. I have um, where I'm sitting, I'm close to my basement, and I leave the door open so I like get the chill. So that's why I have the, the turtleneck on because I purposely enjoy freezing myself. <laughs> Caroline, you got to put yourself on video so we can see. <laughs> we can see your turtleneck. 9.43. Sorry, I was... Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. All right. Okay, everybody. Um, during the break, I, I had a thought about a great way to get us started. And I would... Um, because we know that this is a draft, I would like to invite John Potter from the staff to begin with a few points of feedback that I have already personally received from him related to this document that I think will we'll touch on some points and concerns other people have and will we'll in a nice way get us sort of beginning to digest and think about some of the specific content. John, are you available to us? <laughs> Um, sure, Hal. Uh, <laughs> Talk about surprises. Speaking of the hot seat. <laughs> Just a minute, you didn't give John a 10-day notice, Hal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's getting, he's getting paid the big bucks. <laughs> yeah. I spent enough time on the phone on this over the last week. I'm ready to hear someone else talk for a while. I, so, so this is not a matters from the board then. Um, or, or we're questioning <laughs> that. Well, I, well, in all honesty, if you'd, if you'd like me to report what we discussed, I just felt that you as a staff member delivering that might uh, reduce some of the complexity of conversation on these topics. Uh, so that, that's the goal here. Well, I'm happy to, to um, touch on a, a the few things that we discussed, Hal, and uh, if it's helpful for the other board members um, to hear some of the kind of initial um, thoughts on on the resolution when when staff saw it, and you know the first the first thing was sort of along the lines of uh, some of the things that Michelle was was bringing up um, regarding the fact that most that all of your other motions regarding this topic have uh, come. Um, with a public hearing where the public's had the chance to weigh in on what the board was uh, deliberating on. And the, the board was able to use that feedback from the public to incorporate that into their thinking and their resolu resolutions to date on this, on this topic. Um, this, the second thing maybe Hal was um, just there, there are some, some, uh, language in this in this resolution that uh, may may be a little uh, pr premature at the level that it's at at the level of detail that it's at um, because we just don't have all of the available information that we need yet to you know for instance talk about how many acres might be affected um, and you know how exactly, the um, the project may lay out, which we would learn when the thirty percent design stage is kind of met, and then um, maybe finally that sort of um, there there are some con concepts in this in this resolution that that we haven't had a chance to really understand fully yet, and are problematic on the on the surface just looking at them. Things like um, the escrow. Uh, the escrow section and the um, the language around third party uh, consultants making decisions on uh, open space property that sort of thing. So um, th those were those were the things that that we discussed um, that I that I mentioned to you previously. Um, I'm happy to um, 
elaborate on those. Also, Lauren Kilcoin is is here too, and and she can help on some of our concerns with 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 some of the uh, concepts in this in this resolution. That's great, Lauren. Let me come back to you in just a moment. Um, I'd like to start by saying um, to my co-board members that I find uh, John's, each and every one of John's points uh, credible and convincing. It is um, my view that this does require a public hearing, number one. Um, it is also my view that um, particularly certain information is not yet available, which could technically impact the document in important ways particularly information coming back from CDOT, which has not yet been received. Um, last but not least, uh, because this document was commissioned off of a uh, model that was studied in the granite disposal, there was mention of escrow, basically the concept of aligning funds for a project prior to making commitments for a project. Um, in, when, it, when it's the case of two unrelated parties, we can refer to that as escrow, but that is much more uncommon when done between a single party, in this case, the municipality. Um, so I, I, I also find that interesting. And Lauren, I, I, in a moment, I want you to unpack that a little bit for us. Um, I did speak uh, today with the city attorney's office on a number of these topics. And they also generally agree on the concept of the public hearing being very important. So I think that adds great credibility and also had some confusions about the functionality of escrow within the municipality. Um, there was discussion of, of whether appropriation as opposed to escrow would be a more appropriate approach. Um, with that, Lauren, why don't you help people understand a little bit more the difference between those two types of funding? Yeah, thanks. And I, I'll try not to, to belabor the point since I think both of you covered it uh, pretty well. But, um, but the, the root of it for, for me when I was reading this in the packet was around um, the departments being part of the same organization. So we have the same bank, for example. And so using escrow as, as a mechanism um, would potentially slow down and make much more complicated um, the, the exchange of any dollars through the project. We also exchange funds with other departments very, very frequently. And I hinted at that earlier in the CIP stuff. So we have other methods available to us right now through the ATB. There's a section on transfer in and transfer out of funds. We have interfund transfer accounting entries. Um, and to your point, we've also used reserves and then used appropriation through the budget process to do that. And so I think there's other mechanisms available to us um, when the time comes. And then the, the, the sort of secondary point there is around our requirement to appropriate annually. And so some of this language where we're talking about making commitments in the current year on allocations that don't exist um, yet, and we don't know when they might exist, um, would be problematic just in terms of how the, the city ordinances read around budget. So um, I think my initial my initial reactions were like, okay, there's there's a lot that's in the legal space here that we would need further CAO consultation and in more detail to really understand um, the right mechanism. And, and I would echo what both of you already said, which is let's not lock ourselves into anything too specific right now, if possible. Um, around the restoration work, like. I talked about interdepartmental MOUs earlier. I think that's an option when the time comes. You could also incorporate into total project costs. So uh, all of those would be more familiar um, to how the city operates than, than that escrow concept. Great. Um, I feel, uh, first I'd like to take people's temperature on each and all of those items, which again, I find credible. And that is um, to perhaps put this on a track for a public hearing at our next meeting and to form a committee which will work closely with staff to address some of these uh, technical issues in order to continue moving this document towards something that clearly encapsulates in a single concise way the prior motions of the board and the considerations that we have uh, regarding this. I, I do believe um, one piece, Michelle, you make a very good point. The concept of escrow is not a previously moved item. 
Um, however, the concept, which is essentially that a piece of land containing threatened species is so valuable, we might not be willing to consider disposing of it without fiscal assurance that the project is fully funded and viable um, is a sensible one and is a reasonable one and one that I believe perhaps most board members would agree with. Um, I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, so maybe it's appropriate to sort of take people's temperature on that concept there. Does, 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 let, me, let me pose the question another way. Does, does anyone think that it makes sense for us to entertain a disposal and giving up a piece of habitat with threatened species uh, for a project that may, a project that will be costing tens of millions of dollars, which may or may not be fully funded? Yeah. Another way of another way even of saying is would we do something different here because it's our own city other than what we did with on the granite disposal with a, a separate party. Dave. Yeah, I think uh, some of our thinking is is pretty simple and it's this that the open space fund should not be the repository or the funding entity. Uh, for uh, the project mitigation associated with um, both the construction of a flood wall and uh, restoration of, and mitigation of those impacts. And so, you know, if, if there are better ways of, of doing that in the city financial realm, then, you know, I think that that isn't a, a problem. I think the issue for some of us is that we don't want the open space fund to be the funding mechanism for dealing with project impacts. We believe that the project should fund the impact mitigation work that open space will have to do. I back up just a little bit, Hal, because I, in the purpose of this document, because it, it does go to that question about like how seriously should I take this question about escrow or appropriation or allocation or MOU or interdepartmental inter transfers? Is like, is this document intended to be, hey, we're gonna do, we're gonna ask for these 11, 19 things and these, this, and if we do these things, we will dispose. It's a very good question. It's a very good question. And I'll because be honest. Yeah, just goes to the honest, investment I, I, in this. I, I, I'll be honest. I, I believe it sort of reads that way, and um, I think it's a reasonable feeling to 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 feel that way. And um, I'll, I'll also be very direct in saying, for many years I've been following this project and um, making progress towards some decisiveness about this board's willingness whether or not to dispose a parcel with threatened species will be required at some point. And this is a step in that process. Uh, Hal, I think I'll use this time to jump in on, uh, I've, I've got a couple of additional, either concerns or questions that weren't raised by my colleagues. And one of it's directly related to the fact that whether or not there is the intention on Karen, the drafter of sort of having this be a precursor or related to disposal. I think taking a conservative view, one could view it as a stepping stone as part of a disposal decision, even though it's not the decision. And in that regards, I would highly recommend that we treat this and to notify it and to provide a 10 day notice and to follow 177, even though that this isn't I, I don't think, and I think Karen would agree, I don't think it's Karen's intention that this is the disposal document, but it could certainly be argued that this is in the chain of the disposal consideration. And of that, of that such, it not only should be a public hearing, but we probably need to post it according to 177 and just do our due diligence to view it 
conservatively or take a conservative view that this could be viewed in the realm of making a disposal decision and let's just treat it everything going forward when it is in relation and make sure we're following 177 to a T. So I just wanted to use that opportunity to weigh in one point. I, I think that that's personally, I think it's a great point, Dan. I think there's broad agreement on a public hearing. Um, I will explain um, a piece on this. The, the pacing of this, which seems to come with some indigestion from others um, within the city, the staff, um, and not so much indigestion from the public and the citizens, is that the decision to place annexation negotiations so far forward in time can be read by people as part of this process as an attempt to railroad the open space department into a disposal without due deliberation. And so it is the reason that this is being discussed on a concurrent track and put forward is to address that problem um, and to be clear uh, along the way, sort of what, what we're looking at in terms of environmental mitigation that is important and to prevent ourselves from being railroaded into um, a, a, a decision um, that essentially is pre-planned by other departments. And so I, I think you're very much right about the public hearing. And uh, simultaneously, I, I personally am unfazed by moving this process forward and communicating clearly to um, relevant parts of the city what this board is thinking about this land ownership. So I think, I think there's agreement, there's a public hearing. I, 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 I believe everybody agrees on that. Does anyone not agree with that? So, okay, we, we've, we've got that agreed. Was, was there anything else, Dan, that you had? You're muted, Dan. Uh, that was just a general comment unrelated to what is in the document. And yeah, I mean, I, I do have some underlines throughout it that, uh, you know, once, once we, once the board dives into the details, I certainly will, will chime in. I mean, yep. as John alluded to it, you know, there's, we're referring to a sort of a five acre disposal. And I just want to make sure especially Michelle and maybe those who have not dealt with the disposal situation is, is that even from day one, when we started to hear about five acres of impact, it's not the intention of the op open space department to transfer out and dispose of five acres. We only want to dispose of the amount that will actually have the infrastructure underneath it that will sort of make that part of the property unusable from an open space perspective. The remaining acreage the four acres, the vast majority of the acreage, we want to retain as open space. We do think that there's going to be uh, damage to those lands, but that uh, the way that we would allow or enable use of that would be through a temporary construction or access agreement and not through a, dis and not through a disposal. So it is not the intent of our staff to recommend that we dispose of five acres uh, our recommendation is that we would only dispose of the lands that would be unusable for open space purposes after the project. And right now we're estimating that to be 0.9 acres. Uh, that is also appreciated. And um, much like the issue of escrow and additional forthcoming information from CDOT, um, I, I, based on a few conversations, I think other people also agree that there are some technical uh, ambiguities that remain to be ironed out in this document. Does anyone not agree that there are technical ambiguities to be ironed out? So given that, I think a, a good next step is for us to consider a, a formal board committee of two board members who can work alongside uh, open space staff and the city attorney's office 
um, in order to expedite the correction of some of those technical issues. How, how do people feel about that? Um, I'm, I'm happy to help if it's better for um, someone else to do it. That's completely fine with me too, but um, I, I'm happy to help in any way. Okay. I would like to be part of that. Thank you, Michelle. Sounds like we have two people supporting the idea of a committee. Dave and Karen, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I, I think the idea is fine. Um, yeah, I, you know, uh, I, I guess I'm not convinced that we're going to know the specific details, um, even, you know, if we, we uh, have a public hearing in the, at the June meeting. Um, so I think the spirit of the draft resolution was to at, at least put a number in a place where a number has to be. And, and that number may not be the number that's in the draft, but there, there, there needs to be a number there at, at some point. And so um, I'm not convinced we're gonna know what that number is at the June meeting either but the fact is is that at some point there has to be one um and i think that's the kind of the the uh, essence of of the the specific information in this in this draft resolution so and what do you think the right timing is oh sorry okay. yeah. no, michelle, ahead, I, michelle i'd appreciate we our, our custom is usually to yeah. karen we haven't heard from you yet yeah, um, regarding the, the timing, um, because of the annexation negotiations that, that are proceeding apace, it's my opinion that whatever OSBT has to say get entered into that arena sooner rather than later. And if we are to wait until next fall to uh, provide staff and council with the conditions that we think need to be satisfied before any formal disposal request is considered by OSBT, then by that time, the city will have finished negotiations with CU and our views will have no bearing on those negotiations. That's my personal opinion regarding timing, which is why uh, when we started discussing this in February, um, I have felt that it, it's important to, to keep moving and to, to uh, make a public statement and make it make our views known so that staff and council is aware of the kinds of conditions that we feel are important. Now, if we're to do that before 30% design or any of these other decisions, then as Dave just finished saying, that means we're not gonna have those details. And um, that's why at least in some places it says something like no more than five acres. And I don't find there to be a disqualification when those more general statements about amounts are included, knowing that, that the process will narrow down the details of, of exact amounts later on. I, I, I see a commonality, Dave and Karen, in your comments, and that is many of these technical points are essentially non-material and don't impact the value of the document as a compendium of our resolved business to help be clear and prevent any accidents or misunderstandings as negotiation proceeds. 
Dave? Uh, yes, <laughs> that is true. Um, and Michelle, I, I, I'm, I'm channeling your concern. So I, uh, I actually uh, drafted up um, some motion language that I'd, I'd like to put on the table just to kind of keep moving this conversation along. And uh, I don't know if, if Leah, is Leah still, still here? Can, can you put that up on the screen, Leah? Um, so what this motion is gonna say is that we, we think that, uh, that we should uh, put off considering this formally until the June 9th meeting where a public hearing can be held and further discussion and action by the board uh, can occur. Um, so that what we've done is say, look, and we've given the, the message to whoever needs to hear it. And principally it's city staff who are negotiating the annexation agreement that we're moving ahead, you know, at, at some level on a, a motion that's giving some, um, you know, recommendations and direction and that we're intending to have that in somewhat final form uh, by June 9th. But in the meantime, um, they are aware of here are the things that we think uh, we need to agree on so that there's some indication of what our expectation as a board, what, what those expectations are in the course of the conversation. And we keep coming back to this annexation timing. And, um, you know, originally the flood mitigation project was separate from any annexation consideration. Now that's combined and the annexation schedule seems to be driving the flood mitigation project. And so I think it's just by necessity, uh, we've got to deal with that as we've been talking about uh, pretty soon, almost as soon as we can. So anyway, this is intended for us to at least uh, provide some indication um, to the public that here's what we're gonna do and here's when we're gonna do it. I, I, I personally, I think you're headed in the right direction, Dave. What, what do other people feel? Michelle? Um, yeah, so, so I'm just curious from staff is that, will the timing all, will, all, will that all work out? I mean, we have a, in a in, um, house proposal of working as a, a committee with staff um, and then in advance having another draft posted 10 days prior to the June 9th, if I'm understanding this, um, that we could redraft something um, and have it posted 10 days before the June 9th meeting. Is that, is that humanly possible? <laughs> I think it depends on, on how much you know about the issue before you go into the work. I think it, in terms of if you, to be transparent, if you're hoping to have sort of staff sort of support or on this, to me, we need to separate the mechanisms versus what what the board wants. I mean, a lot of my concern is not so much some of the stuff that we've already heard loud and clear, such as water rights, the 119, the restoration. It's the level of detail of, of the OSBT's approval throughout the process of the next four years of what I would consider execution and management of direction and the insert, insert of the board's authority at certain points, which seems odd and different than I've ever seen it. And also the mechanism of the financing and all those things that are unrelated to annexation. Those are, those are items of sort of how you would eventually execute on the ground, the disposal actions. I think if just a pre, I think if, if we can concentrate over the next two or three weeks on those matters that are important to the board that are gonna be vital to your decision-making on annex, uh, on disposal that have that link to annexation, then I think we can get there. But I, don't, I for one would be very uncomfortable 
saying, yeah, this is a, a staff document as well. If, if a lot of that detail about escrow and, and, and the elements and the timing of when the board gets to be the decision maker rather than the department and the, th and the, and the demand for a 30 third party oversight instead of somebody like Don D'Amico saying, you're good to go there. That's where I'm most concerned. So I think that's a fundamental thing of, if the board wants to continue to drop the whole bunch of detail on sort of non-annexation related matters, um, that I think that timing could be hard because I don't know if we're going to get the staff there. If, if we want to concentrate this document on annexation related matters, I think the timing could work. Um, I, I, a couple just uh, quick points on that. Um, I'm curious to, I'm, I'd be curious just at some point to understand an inventory of um, authorities that you, you haven't previously perceived. Um, because I think stepping back, um, the history of the open space department from the beginning is one of extreme citizen engagement and many, many periods of significant indigestion within the city apparatus. And the reason that we serve as representatives of the citizens in an oversight capacity for this system is to help depoliticize certain decisions. And in that sense, because this is one of the largest decisions that has been brought before this board in many years, it seems to me to make perfect sense to have a, a, a citizen-led effort thinking through this process. And, and, and I will attest, this document in and of itself um, goes far beyond uh, my knowledge, Karen's knowledge, anybody else involved in it. And I think over time, people will find it's a much more beautiful document that they currently feel that it is now. Um, the pieces about the third party oversight, um, Dan, I also find credible and convincing in many ways, and especially layers of cost that that might create. I think that's a really nice place for this committee to really do some discussion and, and talk through how, how um, we may not see eye to eye on that and, and come together. Um, I don't necessarily hold out hope that it will ever be considered a staff document. Um, and, and I just say that to be realistic um, because the charter grants us a, a special role on this and that role isn't to go along with the city machinery. It's to decide what is best under the charter for this acreage, which is the home to threatened species. And that's, you know, that's going to that's gonna make things uncomfortable at times for people who just want to see life go easily. Um, and so I, I, I don't hold out hope that we'll ever get to that perfect place. But I do hold out hope that by establishing a committee, by working through some of these issues, we can get to a, a, a significantly more harmonious place where the primary goal of signaling to all the decision makers involved, our view of the value of this property and the importance of doing the environmental mitigation at an absolute best practice standard is very important. And uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that you guys have made some excellent arguments about how we're actually not quite at best practice here. And I, I think it's the view that we'd like to be. Karen? I agree with you, Hal, about uh, this being a citizen document for the reasons that you've stated. Um, at the same time, uh, as it says on page four, it makes clear that OSMP is to be the lead department within the city in the work. And I, while it's in my mind, while it needs to be a citizen document, that in no way means that the citizens are gonna take the work away from the OSMP staff. Um, and if I were to be part of this subcommittee, um, I would want to hear and discuss with staff their views. But I think in the end, this needs to be a citizen document that's passed by the, by the board if it's to be passed. 
and I and I I've already said I think there are going to be some unknowns that we have to uh, state in in the clearest way that we can, knowing that the details are in the future still, but that that the time to make for the OSBT to make these statements is now, not next fall. Thank you, um, Karen. I, I feel like we're getting down to two pieces of business for resolution. One is establishing a committee, um, which will liaise with the staff and the city attorney's office um, to start to iron out some of the uh, technical uh, imperfections. Um, I also think that it would be wise for us to use a few minutes of this meeting to address any of Michelle's concerns about what in this document doesn't um, represent consensus or resolved business of this board. Um, I think it's very important to the public and for this board that we get clear on, on that because I, I tend to agree that this is primarily resolved business. Um, do people, do, do others feel, okay, uh, Caroline? Well, since we've had like a moment to speak and everyone's had a moment to share, I don't know, Michelle, if you now hearing some of that new information for you, if you have anything else that you want to add? Um, well, what I would like to add, I, I think some, um, I have been trying to get up to speed on all of these issues. I got 18 pages that I was trying to digest this afternoon of past um, motions. Um, I certainly have more um, learning to do, um, but I think that's all part of the process. Uh, Karen, to your point, um, I, you know, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I haven't been involved in this issue for the last 10 years, but I think that's also, <laughs> I think it's also an opportunity. To, yeah. It's also an opportunity to, to have somebody who hasn't been embedded in this. And, you know, I'll, I'll show you that I am a quick study. So I, I, you know, I don't mean to be dragging things um, down, dragging you guys down and slower, but I would like to be involved in, in this process. Did I freeze? Did you guys? Okay. No, I guess it's just like, I thought you guys all froze uh, the, uh, the internet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that there are some differences um, Re, the noise and light being one of them, one being make, uh, you know, try to mitigate the noise and light impacts. And then this one saying there will be no impact. And so there, those are issues that I think are different. Um, and, and just, will you point to me specifically, um, I'm not seeing where it says there will be no impact in the draft resolution. So go one, two, three, four, five, six down. Um, will not result in noise and light pollution impacts on the adjacent OSMP land. Uh, number eight. 8.2. Yep. And I haven't had time to go and compare all of the language, you know, that'd be a lot of work to try to redline this, but no, just- That will be the level of specificity we must go to with this. So I appreciate you highlighting that. And uh, John, the latest is, is that we are, and this traces back to the formal meeting we had on this topic. Um, and actually, I was the, the voice of support for your position, Michelle, which is we need specific lumens and decibels which have enforceability. And John, you're underway on, on that, is my understanding? Uh, we've been um, exploring ways to, to accomplish what we thought the board was directing us to do in March. Yep. So, so that feels very surmountable, Michelle. I think that we will eventually 
get um, get perfect there. Caroline? Um, just in regards to the committee, um, I think it's really important for Michelle's voice to be heard. Um, but I also am concerned about her getting caught up um, in the time commitment. Um, everyone that's on this board and staff knows how much time has been put into CU South, how much time will continue to be put into CU South, how quickly things pop up out of nowhere, um, and they are extremely time consuming. Um, we all know that. So, um, Michelle, I just wanted to let you know, I, I'm happy to serve or not serve, but it does concern me that um, it will take you a long time to, in many hours, to get up to speed. Um, and that that efficiency that I see you strive for um, just might not be able to be reachable. So I just wanted to make that observation known. Yeah, I appreciate that, that uh, you're looking out for me, Caroline. I mean, a part of being on a board um, and having a, a board in general is to have represent proper and um, representation of the community. So, you know, our, our board members should represent our community, which are gonna be, by the way, working parents, people. Right now I work two jobs. Hopefully that second job will be over by this week. Um, but I mean, that I appreciate that this is a, an active and an activist board, but part of having representative government is to make sure that we, all voices are heard. And that's all demographics too. It's not just the demographic of the people who are definitely, there's a lot of passionate people here, but the, it's the demographic who can sometimes be a silent majority because of sort of the machinery involved in the city process. I, I, think, um, I think that's very compelling, Michelle, and your points about a well-constructed committee re uh, represents divergent viewpoints and seeks middle ground really resonates with me. Um, and, and if it is your desire to serve on that committee, I'll ask others, it, it, would it make sense to people that we have Michelle be one of the committee members on this project and then appoint somebody else who's much more comfortable with the document due to the time they've spent on this issue? In my mind, the people who work on the document only bring a draft back to the board and then there are further revisions from the board. So I, I don't think, I mean, I don't need to be on the, on the subcommittee that's working on it. I can work on it after the board packet comes out and bring my version to the board meeting. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm hearing you, you're you not attached to serving in the committee. That's, that's fine, of course. I think people are gonna discover there's quite a bit less work here than, than folks think. Um, well, I think it's a big job. I mean, having worked on it so far, I know how many hours I've put in on it. So I don't want to minimize the work. Well, well, I, I agree with that, Karen, but I'm just saying um, you've covered a lot of ground uh, thus far, and so have I. And this, um, this document, so I, maybe another way for me to express this um, and, and uh, a way I've thought about it. Um, when we went to negotiate on the granite disposal, it was clear that we had an arm's length transaction. The problem with this transaction, it isn't an arm's length transaction. It's a related party transaction. And staff doesn't come to the meeting saying, I'd like to disclose my conflict of interest on this transaction. It's our board's responsibility to recognize that there's a deep inherent conflict and to help parse our way through it. This document, I think you will find really attempts to gracefully thread that needle 
and to help reproduce the same level of diligence that we have with arm's length transactions in terms of what we're gonna do on an intra-city transaction. And um, I think that, that that good faith on that's really shown that every single point that you've brought, John, Dan, I think have been highly reasoned, extremely credible, and actually don't stand in any way in, in, in the face of the goals of the, the, the project. And so I believe a lot of work has been done and, and the next legs will go faster. I, you know, Michelle, I, I see you, you're interested in serving on this committee. I certainly, how, how, how would you guys like to resolve the committee piece of this? Dave? I think if uh, Karen, will serve on it, uh, that would be good. If Michelle wants to serve on it, uh, that's fine with me as well. But I do think that uh, Karen is the voice of having drafted uh, this document that we ought to extend to her the courtesy of participating in uh, making sure that uh, whatever comes before the board for final consideration, um, she has shepherded that process uh, throughout. Also if, Michelle, if you want to um, participate, uh, I think that's that's great. Um, I, I, I agree with you. I think that the access to staff as well and just them being able to, to hear Karen and her ideas, it, that that's, that makes sense. Just to serve Hal and just to offer this, that John will be your point of contact from a staff perspective. So just to make it clear who you have sort of involved from a brain trust standpoint. Yes. Um, and uh, actually it will be Janet from the city's attorney's office who is gonna um, assist us in this project as well. <clears throat> Lauren, I see your hand up. Thanks, and, and maybe this is just, Dan, do you want me to send you other notes? One of the things as I'm, as I'm listening to citizen document and stuff like that, I do the employment work around the code of conduct, and this is not a judgment at all about where this lives on the code of conduct. It's to say that um, as board members, you're subject to it, and there's a lot of language in there around the city's interest compared with personal interest. And so this is just me flagging that for future conversation with Janet, that there's an element of you being considered extensions of staff in, in some parts of the Boulder Revised Code that, that I think need to be looked at. Um, and then there's, there's probably a couple other things here on charter section 175 of like administrative functions and provisions in the charter. So again, this is not me making a judgment. It's just like, I got a bell ringing in my head as I'm hearing citizen document that you're not always considered in that vein. So just to watch for that. Yep. One, one of the great um, fortunes of, of being in this position is that so many very intelligent Boulderites with vast experience lend their knowledge to you. And um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a good listener and willing to draw on it, it's remarkable what this, this small town can provide. And, and, and Karen, if you'd like to serve, I think it makes a lot of sense, but I heard you with a little bit of hesitance and I've watched you do quite a bit of listening to members of the community in order to help us ar arrive at what is really a mosaic. Um, and if you're exhausted by it, I understand too. So let us know what your, your feeling is. I sense disappointment. I, I almost feel like it would be better for, for somebody else to take a stab at it and uh, for me to make amendments after a new version comes out. Fair enough. I, I think that's reasonable. Dave, is this something you're willing to do? Uh, I would be willing to do it. Uh, I will offer up another suggestion. And, and if Caroline w wants to serve on it, uh, I'm fine with that as well.
I also would be happy to be in this role, but frankly, it always ends up a phone call at the last minute to me. And, you know, I end up hearing about what's going on no matter what, so. Caroline, is this something you're interested in? Yeah, I'm happy um, to go ahead and, and do it. Great. Um, I really appreciate your willingness to do that. So um, unless there is any opposition, we are going to set up Caroline and Michelle to, to liaise with John Potter as the lead contact on staff at OSMP. And um, with Janet from the city's attorney's office to over the next month, start to um, see our way through some of the technical failings. Um, I do uh, personally feel that um, putting this document out there and the knowledge of the, the core commitments, which are resolved business have been well noticed, well processed, well um, considered are, are, are all in there. Um, I get that uh, it, it's uncomfortable because it's not a staff generated document, but in this case, we're gonna need to overcome that. Um, and so I appreciate everybody's patience with the, the tradition of citizen led work in the open space department of Boulder, Colorado. Does anyone else um, have anything on that issue or specific items that they feel were, have not been well enough or prior discussed or agreed by the open space board? Karen. I just wanna clarify the process that I think you've outlined. Great. Um, I think what you've said is Michelle and Caroline are going to work on a revised draft with John and Janet um, and create a citizen document, a document for OSBT that will be included in the next packet. Correct with the intention of acting on it at the June meeting. I would say with the possibility of acting on it, if we can get to a place where we have uh, the votes for it. I, I mean, my vote is not for it until certain of these issues are resolved to my satisfaction. Uh, Hal? Dave? I guess I, I want to keep on the table uh, the motion that uh, I offered so that there is, again, if, if the board's desire is, is such that uh, it indicates to the community that we are moving ahead in this process. I think that that would be very beneficial as an outcome of this meeting in preparation for the June meeting uh, so that, you know, the community understands that um, we're further considering uh, revising this, this proposal, but we're, we're still, uh, it's still under consideration and, and there will be some, you know, formal action presumably at, taken at some point. I just think that it, yes. that would be meritorious for this board to do as a, as a result of this conversation. Yes, I think um, I think what is uh, clear to everybody at some point um, this this has to be decided business. Um, it's been many years. We've been here talking about it, and we're going to keep moving this incrementally down the road. So, um, John. Um, I, I would just in, in helping helping us help the board. Um, I, I would I would ask if if there would be any interest in exploring the idea of doing a conditional disposal in June, and having this resolution be turned into something that has the conditions in it that were they met, then we would dispose of the property needed project. 
Doesn't that go against all the unknowns that everyone's talking about though? Yeah. I'm yeah. and it would have it would have to be written in a way to capture those unknowns at the right level with the right with, with enough um, checks in it that it would be comfortable enough to a majority of the board. Um, my vote for that would be no at the moment. And and John, just um, uh, in, I think if, if one does look close at this document, you'll see that we made great efforts to do those exact things here. Um, I, I personally would need to learn more about what the difference between a conditional disposal and saying a disposal won't be considered until such conditions met is. Um, but I, I, I grant that there's probably something I don't understand there as well as others to learn. Karen. I would like to second Dave's motion. And the second on the motion is to table this item for a public hearing at the June 9 meeting. So further, in dis uh, further discussion and action by OSBT can occur. Before we vote on that, Hal, can we just look at the calendar with the June 9th uh, date in mind? Because we have, uh, to notice 10 days, we'd have to post another draft. Like, is that May 30th? Is that right? Am I doing the, okay. So we'd have to come up with a new draft by and post it May 30th. And just working, looking, I'm looking at my calendar, one, two, that's 14, 15, 16, 17 days from now. Yep. yep. Including a shop. memorial. Memorial Day holiday. So I just want to make sure, John, that you're around and that's all possible. If I can confirm with Leah too, um, in order to do the posting, she probably needs to send the, we just need to notify, we don't actually have to post this document 10 days. We just have to provide a public notice that a public hearing is going to be conducted. I see, okay. So on the so Leah on the end of the before the end of the day on Friday the twenty eighth would just have to make sure that she got the posting notification out to satisfy that. But Michelle, I'm not. I don't think the actual document needs to be out at that time too. Can we? So then that would be the normal June sec. Uh, yeah, June second time frame. That that's right. Yeah, it's and and, and even that that is. That's our customary is we like to get things to you at least seven days ahead of time. I think actually in the parameters of the 2000 uh, uh, sort of board description, I think we pledge to get things at least five days, but our customary is to do it at least to do seven days. But our, in this term, we just have to notify the public 10 days ahead that we're going to be holding a, a public hearing on a disposal related matter. So that, the document doesn't need to be done by then. Caroline. Um, just because this is such a big community issue, I would advocate, I know that that is the standard, but I would advocate to go above and beyond and maybe post as soon as possible. And then again at 10 days, just to have as much community involvement as possible. Um, I just wanna make sure that um, everyone feels heard, that everyone can get the memo, that the community has time to speak with friends and um, do what they need to do to section off their time to be able to be at the meeting if they so choose and, and all of those things. Since the document doesn't have to be available at that time, that, that would just be my what I would advocate for. Uh, to, yeah, to whatever extent um, we, we want to communicate widely about um, this taking place, I, I do think it's a good moment for the public to pay attention um, because, because a lot of motions have been made and we're getting towards the end of that phase of this. But not, if it's not a conditional disposal, we're not at the end, Hal. It will go on well into the uh, later part of this year. Um, and so, so I think that that's an important thing that um, you uh, uh, discuss with the committee 
um, and, and we'll circle back on that and, and what the exact wording difference is. Um, it seems to me that that would pertain to maybe six sentences of the document. And uh, I'll be interested to see what, what the other language might look like. Dave. Yeah, you know, we've got a motion on the floor uh, that's been seconded. I'd like to call the motion. Great. Um, let's uh, move to a vote. I'm going to call the roll. Um, we have uh, moved by Dave and seconded by Karen. So I call uh, Caroline. How do you how do you vote on this motion? Yes. Michelle, how do you vote? Yes. And I also vote affirmatively, and so that is unanimous business. Dave, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, it seems like with that, we are uh, then closed on that topic and ready to move to our next matter. Um, and so here in my uh, world of getting my feet under me in this new position of helping um, shepherd our agenda, I find ourselves in an interesting position where um, essentially, a, uh, this comes back, Michelle, of sort of like, how did this happen? I find myself um, with a letter in the packet, which is addressed to CPW, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, regarding their recent visitor usage management plan in El Dorado State Park. And the impetus was a desire um, by board members to communicate some thoughts regarding that plan um, in some way, uh, because the deadline for comments is before our next meeting. And so uh, let me just finish for a second. And so um, a letter uh, was presented um, to be uh, bubbled up for matters from the board for community consideration. And then at some point after discussion, even with Dan and other staff members, a point was raised that in the guiding principles of board and council interaction, that it is, um, it is, it, it is a guiding principle that boards and commissions do not communicate directly on policy issues um, with international, national, statewide, or county uh, level government organizations. And that the appropriate channel is actually to um, submit OSBT's comments as a recommendation to staff for them to then submit by the deadline before our next board meeting um, in their formal comments um, as open space and mountain parks to, to CPW. Um, Dan, do you believe that I said that correctly? I believe that's how I received the interpretation from Janet, yes. Okay, and yes, so for clarity, that, that is um, from the city attorney's office on a procedure and tech technical matter. Um, and so, in order to expedite um, the main goal, which is to uh, have some commentary on the VUMP plan uh, and to have a public discussion and create and craft those comments, we've essentially taken the letter and we've uh, redrafted it in the form of a recommendation to staff uh, for consideration in their uh, official communication to CPW at such time as they do that. And um, I'd like to ask uh, Leah to please bring that up if possible um, for the board to review. Well, can I, can I jump in here? Um, yes. Because I, I am going to recuse myself from this discussion. Um, uh, I started working with a nonprofit called Access Fund on April 1st. I'm still doing my old job right now. So I'm working both jobs, but, um, and uh, Access Fund protects America's climbing. Um, they, they have not, um, at least as far as I could uh, sort of in my research discern, that had not make it, made any official comments on uh, to CPW or to OSBT about um, the, um, the Eldo Walker Trail or any um, whatever the right terminology is, the, what, what, what's now the, the UMP. 
Um, but they may. And so considering I still work, for, and even though I'm not in the policy section, um, I do finance and, and business operations, uh, I've decided to recuse myself from this, uh, this subject. Well, and thanks. so that's why I didn't want you to go too far. <laughs> yes, no, um, I, I, I appreciate it. I just want you to know all the, the history. Um, it's greatly appreciated um, you having that self-awareness and uh, w w thank you. Okay. Um, and we respect the decision. Thank you. Uh, have a good evening. Great, yes, this is our final piece of business, everyone. So if everyone else is okay with it, um, I, I think it's all right for uh, Michelle to review the videotape at some point later for interest. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Great. So um, I think everybody had uh, some time to look this over in the packet. And so I will open it up immediately to thoughts, questions, um, and other considerations. Maybe I could offer my own, yeah, Dave, go ahead. Well, you can go ahead, you know, uh, if you want, but okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna make an observation after the end of this, but uh, I certainly support this. Um, I think the open space board along, obviously the open space staff uh, has participated in this, you know, planning process for three years. And uh, the board, uh, you know, has been participatory through staff updates and, and uh, reviews of documents and even uh, requests from uh, CPW for opportunities to comment. So I think this uh, is warranted. Um, my observation is, and I don't mean this to throw a monkey wrench in, in anything, but I don't see this as commenting on policy whatsoever. This, the, the board's comments are basically on management issues as they relate to management issues, similar management issues on adjacent open space and mountain parks and lands. And so it, as far as any kind of uh, policy uh, commentary, um, I don't agree with that interpretation at all. Having said that, I am fine with this process mm -hmm. uh, and uh, hope that we can move ahead uh, forthrightly and, and approve uh, this language. Yes, um, let me comment back on that, Dave. Um, the, and, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the core point where there was conjecture that there might be policy by giving my plain English overview of what I believe the letter says. And the letter in my mind essentially expresses our empathy to um, other public lands and wildlife planners about the complexity and trade-offs, especially after COVID-19 and the upsurge in usage of our public lands about the difficulty of decision-making processes in that. In my opinion, that's really the, uh, the, the large part of the first couple pieces of this. And then um, it also turns to a description of the extensive planning that we've done for our own trails and our own systems and the amount of public input that we've received on that. And essentially the, the, the part that could or could not be considered policy related is, the, is essentially what, what I read as, and we may not have worded right. And if there's anything we have to look at, it's this part in my opinion. Um, a piece that says we um, we just hope that uh, other adjacent public lands management organizations, in this case the state park, uh, respects that any changes to our own trail usage programs are a matter of this department and potentially a matter of this board, um, and should not be any foregone conclusion or assumption. Um, whether that's policy or not, I think is quite debatable. And frankly, the city attorney's office granted that it was debatable. Um, however, I don't see any downside to 
uh, redirecting our, our thoughts and input in this manner. And uh, we certainly learned something new about uh, some, some elements of uh, intergovernmental workings. I, I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> Karen? Um, before we uh, deal with this directly, I have a question for Dan that I'd like to gain some insights on. And, and that is an, uh, an explanation from your perspective, Dan, about why we would lease to the state park um, a trail. Because I'm not aware that, that OSMP has leased trails to other agencies. And so my question is, why would we do that? Well, I, um, there hasn't been any direct, conver you know, lease negotiations starting at all. I suppose we could conjecture that um, that portion of the trail, that um, the Fowler Trail, uh, where the other, it's not a social trail, is it post office trail? When that comes up and then state trail is perhaps through through talks, one agency could make a compelling argument that by having consistent signage and consistent um, management approaches could be beneficial. And so um, I'm just conjecturing here, Karen. So I, I could see an argument being made that perhaps on a section of trail to have it be consistently managed could be a compelling argument. And I think that, uh, um, you know, and I, so by not taking it off the table is probably a good thing if, if there's compelling reasons why a conversation like that should ensue. But there's nothing, there's nothing in the works of, about, about that. But as, as a process, would OSMP lease a trail to another agency, a trail that's on our lands? Dan, maybe I can help out if you don't mind, because yeah. there is kind of that case with already with uh, El Dorado Canyon State Park where we lease part of the uh, Rattlesnake Trail to them that does actually cross part of Open Space and Mountain Parks. But because of the way that trail set up, it starts within the state park. It made sense for a consistency of management given the type of access and use that occurred on that. Similarly to some of their other climbing access trails that happened between kind of the juxtaposition of our property boundaries. So it made sense from a consistency of management that we lease some of the trails that would otherwise be managed by us to the state park. So that's kind of in this direct way, a relative situation where in the past, we've found that to be a mutually agreeable way to better create consistent management. And can you give me any idea about the length of these trails that you're describing? Uh, not off the top of my head, sorry, Karen. I don't know, I couldn't give you the, the specifics. I don't know if Casey's available. She may be even closer to the details of that, but. Certainly something we can find out and we can share. I can share that with you, Karen. I can get you those details. Rattlesnake Gulch, the total is 3.6. I just pulled it up to familiarize them, but I, I don't know how much is leased. Yeah. It's less and, and another example there is where it may cross into a piece of open space and then right back into the state park. And that may be the case with Rattlesnake, where again, you know, you, it would be best not to have these, you know, changes in how a trail's managed uh, right in the, intervening segments of a trail. It's less than a mile that uh, is on open space. Rattlesnake Gulch, yes. less than a mile. Thank you. And there's no access. I think that's the other thing, Steve. There's no access from uh, any other open space trail or, or any adjacent open space. It's, it's strictly from the state park, right? Right. And it's an out and back trail. So it doesn't uh, really connect with any other trail, either on open space or state parks. And I don't know, Steve, do you remember when that lease was done? 
You're muted. You're you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> Getting late. I got to remember do all the buttons here. Um, I think it's a longer term lease, like ten years, and I think we still have until like twenty twenty six before it's up for renewal. Thanks. Does anybody else have any thoughts or, or questions here? Um, is, as long as everyone believes that that interpretation I have, which is, we, you know, we, we reserve the right to manage our own trails according to our own public outreach and internal processes, and that we have empathy for the complexity of these decisions, I um, am comfortable with this. And um, I'm a little less concerned about um, the leasing. I can imagine certain situations where it could make sense, um, but I also feel strongly that um, this board and the department will do a great job of considering any of that at such time as it might arise. Hal, are you uh, ready to entertain a motion? I, I certainly am. Uh, I would like to make it. <laughs> I, I move that uh, the Open Space Board ad, adopt, approve the uh, language uh, in the following recommendations to staff in its review and comment on the Alvarado Canyon State Park Visitor Use Management Plan. Great. I'll um, second. Great. Um, before we go to a uh, vote, I would just like to ask um, Dan, does any part of this letter jump out at you as something that would be difficult to incorporate into your comments or challenging? Yeah, um, to be honest, I'm not a uh, part of the point people that are working on our comments. Um, so I think Steve may be the closest involved in that subgroup. Um, but we may have to just say, we will certainly provide this to the group that's uh, formulating the, uh, the comments that will then sort of rise up to, to myself to, to look at and review. Um, but I don't have an, any initial comments to see if it's consistent with what we're coming up with so far or not. And I don't know. Yeah, if Dan, Dan, I was just gonna add, we, we, we can just take a look and get back to the board if anything crops up once yeah. Kate chance to properly review it. Great. I, I, I thought it was um, primarily an expression of compassion, which tends to always be a good thing. <laughs> I, I've never heard us term that way. <laughs> uh, Caroline had a comment a while back, and I don't know whether. Yeah, I don't, I don't know since we've already made a motion. I don't feel like it was I, I feel okay letting it go. Okay, then why don't we uh, run the roll on this one? And um, we have uh, Dave with the motion, Karen on the second, so Caroline. Yes. And I also vote yes. So this is uh, not unanimous business. We have Michelle in recusal on this. Um, and four trustees in an affirmative vote. Is that um, good, Leah? Are we, we good there? Wonderful. Well, I appreciate everybody sticking in uh, later in the evening. I know it wasn't the easiest meeting um, we've ever had, um, but maybe not the hardest either. So um, I appreciate everybody's time. And uh, unless anyone has any objections, I think we are prepared to adjourn. Thank you very much, Hal. You did a nice job. Yeah, good job, Hal. And thanks to staff, too. Yeah. Thank you, everybody who stuck with us and members of the public especially. Have a great night.